For me and other foreigners, the main purpose of coming is to earn money to feed our families. We sometimes pay brokers our last savings for a work permit and for transport. And when we face deceit, violation of employee rights and human dignity in the workplace, most of us cannot just quit and find a better job and fight for our rights in court. Most migrants will simply not have neither time nor money. Moreover, there is no guarantee that a new employer will not be worse than the previous one. Labor migrant from Ukraine in Poland. We knew that we had to seek help somehow, since the way we were treated by the employers caused us to burn both physically and mentally. We were so used to working hard and being productive and we wanted to do good. When working, we wouldn't at least be thinking about our, uh, our, all our troubles. This is the words from a victim of trafficking for labor exploitation in Finland. Ladies and gentlemen, these and similar stories reflect the reality labor migrants face in the Baltic Sea region countries and also all around the world. We would like to welcome you today to our conference Competence Building, Assistance Provision and Prevention of Trafficking in Human Beings for Labor Exploitation. This conference is organized by the Council of the Baltic Sea States and the Ministry of Interior of Latvia um, under the auspices of the CBSS Lithuanian Presidency. And we would like to express our thanks to the Swedish Gender Equality Agency and to the CBSS Project Support Facility for funding our work against trafficking labor exploitation. My name is Veneta Polatside. And my name is Edi Mujai, and we are honored to moderate this conference uh, and having you participants with us today on the other side of the screen. And we are live from Stockholm, Sweden. The Baltic Sea region is a dynamic, high-performing economic region. Often described as the top of Europe, uh, it is also one of the safest regions in the entire world. Therefore, the strong and successful traits uh, that define our region should also be reflected in our anti-trafficking work in practice. And this is the reason for why we are asking the following today. Do we need to rethink the concept of preventing and combating human trafficking for labor exploitation? Why is it so that the number of victims are increasing in our region, while so few victims receive the assistance they are entitled to? Why are legitimate businesses engaged in labor exploitation at all? And finally, are we as states and societies facilitating labor exploitation without knowing it? Over the course of today, we will hear from our distinguished speakers, including policy makers, non-governmental organizations working on ground, international organizations, academia and survivors. Our speakers will not only focus on why, but also on how and what we can do to improve our responses to hu human trafficking for labor exploitation. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to the Minister of Interior of Lithuania, Ms. Agne Bilotaita, to the, deliver her opening remarks. Dear guests and participants of the conference, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's important conference. The conference is organized by the Council of the Baltic Sea States Task Force Against Trafficking in Human Beings under the auspices of the Lithuanian Presidency. I am glad that it is also culmination of project, competence, building, assistance, provision and prosecution of labor exploitation cases in the Baltic Sea region. Trafficking is in human beings for the purpose of labor exploitation is uh, modified from slavery in modern society. It is sad to admit that this crime is not of selective nature. Men, women and children in the region and around the world are confronted with 
inhumane work condition and suffer exploitation. This is the reason why Lithuania chose to fight against labor exploitation as a priority of its presidency. The success to fighting against human trafficking lays within the prosperous development of Baltic Sea region. Of course, a lot of has already been done to combat trafficking for labor exploitation. I strongly believe that our initiatives based on mutual cooperation and concrete commitments will bring the best results. Together, we initiated positive developments in the area of fight against human trafficking in the region by signing two important documents. First, the joint statement of commitment to work against human trafficking for labor exploitation in the Baltic Sea region. And second, the Vilnius Declaration, a vision of the Baltic Sea region until 2030. Ending the Lithuanian CBSS presidency, I would like to thank everyone who has involved in preparation of those two documents. They will pave the way for further work in order to bring the Baltic Sea region one step closer to being free from trafficking. We very much hope that this conference will be a great opportunity to share your views and experience and join our efforts to prevent this serious crime. I wish you all meaningful and constructive discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you for your unwavering support and your full commitment to combat human trafficking for labor exploitation. It has been very clear during the Lithuanian presidency of the Council of the Baltic Sea States that labor exploitation as an issue has been put high up on the political agenda. So we are very grateful for that. Thank you very much. I would like to continue by giving the floor to the Director General of the Swedish Gender Equality Agency, Ms. Lena Aag. Lena, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to speak at this important event. Human trafficking and exploitation is a crime against humanity and it is system threatening in the sense that it has close links to corruption and abuse of power affecting the labor market at all levels. Firstly, the human suffering and the vulnerability of victims of trafficking in the form of low or no pay, unreasonably long working days, substandard housing and lack of protective equipment, etc. Then reduced tax, rev tax revenues and companies that offer fair conditions cannot compete and risk being eliminated. This creates an unhealthy labor market. The Swedish Gender Equality Agency has responsibility for national coordination of the work against prostitution and all forms of human trafficking. The work against forced labor, human trafficking and human exploitation in working life is thus within the Equality Agency's coordination responsibility. Our agency also has educational information assignments within this field and we work actively to ensure that victims and potential victims of human trafficking are offered the protection and the support that they are entitled to. According to the commitments, regulations and conventions that Sweden is party to. The Swedish Gender Equality Agency has no operational capacity, but regional coordination, coordinators par partially financed by the Gender Equality Agency work actively to ensure that victims of human trafficking receive protection and support. This is done in collaboration with other actors in the field, most often the police, social services and civil society. Regional coordinators also participate in joint workplace inspections. 
In order to combat work-related crime, government cooperation and coordination is key. No single authority has the ability to solve the problem alone. Cooperation is required between authorities as well as between the labour market parties and civil society. The Swedish Gender Equality Agency is today an active part in a government cooperation which includes eight government agencies by the Swedish Work Environmental Authority. The CAPE project, financed by the Gender Equality, Swedish Gender Equality Agency and administrative, administrated by CBSS, is an example of such cooperation that has resulted in several country reports. These reports give us extensive information on why there is a lack of prosecutions for trafficking related to labour uh, exploitation. The reports also provide insights into labour migrants at risk of being exploited in countries of destination and important findings which gives us an updated overview of the human trafficking situation in the Baltic region, allowing us to better combat this form of organised crime. From a gender perspective, both men and women are victims of exploitation in the Swedish labour market. However, often in different fields. Men in the construction industry, car workshops, car washes, etc. And women very often in the beauty business, massage and cleaning business, in the green sector and at restaurants and more recently in the forest industry. Both men and women are exploited on the same premises. Multiple exploitation tends to affect women more often. Several cases have been reported where women are exploited in the labor market. Both, as, uh, both are equally forced, um, sorry, several cases have been reported where women are exploited on the labor market but are equally forced to offer sexual services, for example, in the massage industry. When it comes to men who are exploited in the labour market, they are, they're, they're, they are in many cases not generally seen as victims and do not see themselves as such either. From a human rights and a gender perspective, it is very important that both men and women receive victim status and are given support and protection they are entitled to. Today we have a fairly good knowledge of the conditions on the Swedish labour market. We know that men, women and children from other countries are at risk of being exploited. We know that the risk for perpetrators to be revealed, unfortunately, is still small. And the profit is so big that the risk of being arrested is something they handle in their calculations. Legislations, conventions and regulations are in place and have been ratified. We are at a point now where we have to translate our knowledge into action to ensure the rights of the victims, to put an end and to prosecute perpetrators and in cooperation with others work for a fair and healthy labour market. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, thank the CBSS and the Organisation Committee for this important cooperation and I look forward to continued good cooperation and joint learning and um, I hope this conference will prove fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ock, for your support to the uh, our CAPE project and uh, for underlying the importance of cooperation at the national but also at the international level. Thank you. And now I would like to pass the floor to the EU anti-trafficking uh, coordinator, Mr. Olivier Onidi, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Unfortunately, Mr. Onidi could not join us um, in person because of the travel arrangements, but he sent us um, our recorded address.
Good morning to you all, despite not being able to join you uh, online uh, uh, or physically. I am very thankful to uh, you for this opportunity to address uh, uh, very short uh, messages uh, uh, to you all. First and foremost, to thank you for the initiative that you have uh, taken, uh, notably, of course, the statement of commitment, which you uh, will be presenting, uh, but also discussing uh, during this important uh, event, and a statement of uh, commitment on a very important uh, aspect. Uh, not only are you looking at the uh, area and uh, uh, the problem we still face with the trafficking of uh, human beings, but you are looking at one of the specific aspects of this, uh, which is uh, uh, human beings being trafficked for labor purposes. This is important because it is not uh, uh, necessarily the aspect which has gained the most prominence, but we know it is important. We know that uh, more than 15% of uh, human beings being trafficked are trafficked for labor purposes. We know that uh, uh, the number is uh, growing, and we know that it, co it concerns uh, uh, men, women, but also children. And it is not only something uh, that we see outside of the European Union, outside of our individual countries. It is very much also a phenomenon we have to fight uh, within uh, our uh, borders, within our jurisdiction, uh, uh, the European Union and its uh, neighborhood. So thank you again for this major initiative. I believe, as uh, the statement of commitment uh, uh, reflects, uh, this subject, because of its difficulty, because also of the massive investment that is needed on the side of the law enforcers and also judiciary, necessitates very strong political backing, very strong political orientation. And this statement is very much about uh, uh, this. It does also uh, necessitate orientations in terms of uh, the most important thing to do. One of those things uh, that uh, the statement acknowledges is the fact that uh, one needs to do a lot more awareness raising. Uh, many of the inspectors conducting labor uh, inspect, uh, inspections uh, within corporations on the construction side do not necessarily have the training, the understanding, or even uh, uh, the uh, information that uh, uh, in front of them, uh, there might actually be uh, individuals, uh, uh, trafficked individuals being abused uh, for uh, labor purposes. So a lot more awareness raising, explanation, training about these many different dimensions of how individuals are being uh, uh, trafficked for labor purposes is absolutely uh, crucial. Second aspect is uh, to make sure that while fighting the trafficking uh, uh, of uh, human beings uh, being exploited for labor purposes, we use the full extent of our labor uh, normative uh, instruments. We do have quite uh, developed uh, labor framework everywhere in the European Union, in all uh, the members of the Baltic uh, Council. This needs to be used to protect individuals being trafficked, and uh, also uh, progressively close the doors to those that exploit individuals for such uh, uh, purposes. And then finally, there's an important also commitment uh, on our side uh, to do more internationally, do, no, do more in terms of uh, making sure that the entire logistics chain, the entire value chain uh, does not entail uh, uh, aspects of uh, human beings uh, being uh, abused. Uh, we've started doing this with uh, strong commitments uh, and uh, uh, also provisions in trade agreements, in investment agreements, uh, uh, also in our development agreements with uh, a number of countries around the world. We need to do more and possibly also develop such arrangements uh, uh, in uh, the EU as such. Uh, this is one of uh, uh, the proposal the European Commission is currently working on, uh, having a system of due diligence uh, uh, to be implemented by all uh, uh, companies, due diligence in terms of uh, possible uh, uh, damages on the environment, but due diligence also in terms of making sure companies do take uh, actions uh, 
which are fully in line with the fundamental rights of uh, uh, people. And this uh, leads us uh, also to uh, put in uh, uh, this new legislation uh, some provisions uh, that will uh, improve even further the analysis companies will do as to where do they buy uh, their equipment, where do they uh, contract out their service in order to verify that uh, these contractors are not subject to uh, elements of trafficking of human beings. For all this, I thank you again immensely for your contribution, for your engagement, and I look forward uh, to work uh, uh, together in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nidhi, for underlining the importance of the Joint Statement of Commitment, which has been adopted by the Member States of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. Um, you also made a very interesting remark regarding companies. You mentioned that we, on a European level, must cooperate to make sure that companies and the private sector understand social responsibility as a question, as not only as a question of environmental issues, but also a question of human rights issues. I think this is a very important remark. I would now like to give the floor to the Director General of the Council of the Baltic Sea States, Ambassador Grzegorz Poznanski. Grzegorz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, first, uh, I wish to thank and congratulate the Lithuanian presidency of the CBSS for putting high on its agenda the issue of human trafficking and labor exploitation. Achila Bay. The CBSS is focused on building safe and secure, prosperous and sustainable Baltic Sea region. And to achieve our priorities, we need strong region. And we are always stronger when we work together. Human traffickers are ruthless and ambitious in running their criminal enterprise. We need to be even more ambitious in our purpose to eliminate this crime, in our vision to create safe region, and this ambition should be reflected in our concrete actions. We understand well that our society is only as strong, safe and protected and prosperous as our ability to care for each other and especially to protect the most vulnerable ones. Thanks to the cooperation with our member states and through the expertise of the Task Force on Trafficking of Human Beings and Children at Risk in the CBSS Secretariat and other expert groups, we are well suited to build further good practices, international collaboration and real action in the Baltic Sea region and beyond. At the same time, we need to acknowledge the emerging challenges ahead. The recent Baltic Sea meeting of Ministers of Foreign Affairs and High Representatives valued highly the CBSS work on trafficking of human beings and noted significant progress we have achieved. With Vilnius II declaration and newly adopted CBSS action plan, this area will be of high focus in our work during the next decade. Human trafficking for labor exploitation is prevalent in the Baltic Sea region. When addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, we must also address the outcomes of the post-pandemic society and the effect this period already has and will have further on economies and employment. Harsh economic times lead to exploitation and increases vulnerability. People in desperate situations take desperate decisions. Also those risking the, raising the risk of being trapped into trafficking and forced labor. During the last decade, there have been many developments in methods and strategies to combat the growing phenomenon on trafficking in human beings for the purpose of labor exploitation in the Baltic Sea region. Member states have set up multidisciplinary working groups or other mechanisms to address this crime. Several countries have adopted national strategies or action plans with specific, which specifically address trafficking in human beings for the purpose of labor exploitation. 
building on the achievements made to combat trafficking in human beings for the purpose of labor exploitation nationally and internationally, the member states of the Council of the Baltic Sea States declared their strong determination to eradicate this crime and signed a joint statement of commitment to works against human trafficking for labor exploitation in the Baltic Sea region. I want to stress that all member states support the joint statement and to work and are committed to work in the same direction. Together as a team, the Baltic Sea region, we are committed to build our economies and lives free from exploitation and based on fun fundamental values such as freedom, equality and dignity. As we hear from experience of some of our member states, along with government agencies, prosecutors, police, labor inspectors, we need to bring business, civil society, academia, media and other actors on board because it is shared responsibility. A systemic and inclusive approach to fight this crime with trust, collaboration and heart is needed. Today, a combination of speakers and participants, government, academia, practitioners and many others, representing more than 30 countries, reflects the importance of cooperating across borders and across sectors. We need to put more efforts to ensure sustained and systematized capacity building and training for all the relevant stakeholders. We need to put in place relevant legislation to ensure criminal responsibility for all scenarios in scenarios in which workers are trafficked to be exploited by being subject to unacceptable working conditions. We need to promote labor protection in sectors and industries, industries prone to exploitation and long and complex supply, chain, supply chains and pay special attention to irregular workers. For, we need to foster awareness on human trafficking for labor exploitation among the public through prevention measures and public communication. I hope that the joint statement of commitment will be a good roadmap and enable our member states to support each other, to learn from each other and encourage each other, each other even more because we are all allies in this work against human trafficking and trust should be at the heart of our efforts. I want to thank my team in the CBSS Secretariat, Lithuanian colleagues from the Ministry of Interior and all partners in the CAKE project for organizing this important event. I wish you a successful conference, which I hope will contribute to robust and effective action in human trafficking, in fighting against human trafficking for labor exploitation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Poznanski. Thank you for highlighting that the focus of all work against trafficking and all strategies should have uh, the focus on people, especially people in vulnerable positions in our region. I think also you voiced in a very essential word in your welcoming remarks, which is trust. Trust, building trust among national state actors and organizations is key in order to establish a strong and solid work against trafficking human beings. And as you said, the joint statement of commitment adopted by the member states of the Council of the Baltic Sea States will be a roadmap uh, leading the way um, to the work against trafficking. Keeping in mind the remarks about partnership and trust, we will now close the introductory remarks. Dear participants, as uh, we want you to stay fresh and uh, alert during the day, we will now uh, go for a break. This is also fair to the participants from other time zones participating today. So we will be back 10.15, so please uh, take the opportunity to grab a coffee, stretch a bit, or um, a quick breakfast. And we will be back with the first panel of today, which I guarantee will be super interesting. So see you very soon. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had the time to grab some uh, coffee or some tea. And uh, 
We're soon about to start with the first panel of this conference, but before moving on, I would just like to inform you, the participants today, you are able to ask questions to the speakers in the panels during the panel sessions. This you can do by clicking on the Q&A button uh, located next to the panel titles um, on the conference platform which you are logged into at the moment. So please don't hesitate, write in the questions you have for our panelists and you can start, start writing your questions um, from the moment we begin the panel. Moving on straight to the first panel of today, which is called Rethinking the Concept of Preventing and Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for Labor Exploitation. The human trafficking legislation has been in place in most of our member states for a considerable amount of years. And for those of you who have been active in this field for a while now, it is clear that progress has been made during the years. I think this becomes extra clear when we look at the uh, Baltic Sea region, where we see several actions and initiatives that have been hugely successful in countering human trafficking. And we take a look at the international cooperation today, it's stronger than ever before. However, if one is to have a critical look on this, which we are about to have during this panel today, we, need, we know that a lot more needs to be done, not only in terms of legislation and awareness, but also on how we collectively understand human trafficking for labor exploitation as a phenomenon. The pandemic has resulted in more victims identified in some of our member states than in previous years. We also expect a surge in victims of human trafficking in our post-pandemic economies and societies. And this leaves us with the question, are the current strategies that we have enough to counter labor exploitation and to assist those victims who uh, need victim assistance and are entitled to it? We will discuss this question and other questions today during this panel with our excellent panelists, consisting of Dr. Petja Nestorova, who is the Executive Secretary at the Council of Europe she has a familiar face to many of us today, and she has been responsible for the Council of Europe's actions against human trafficking uh, since 2010. Welcome, Petya. We have Dr. Daniel Arut, who is the Finnish government's anti-trafficking coordinator. Uh, She's, I'm sorry, Dr. Venla Ruch is the Finnish government's anti-trafficking coordinator. Currently, she's also the Finnish representative of the Council of the Baltic Sea States Task Force Against Trafficking in Human Beings. We have Professor Zbigniew Lasochik, who is a full professor of law and criminology, specializing in human trafficking, serious criminality, prison systems and human rights. He's currently also the director of the Human Trafficking Study Center at the University of Warsaw in Poland. We have Mr. Hiab Johannes, who is a researcher at the University of Glasgow and a member of the International Survivors Advisory Council. And last but not least, we have Ms. Melita Grevska Graham, who is from the International Center for Migration Policy Development. Uh, she's, a, she's currently the head of the organization's anti-trafficking program. So let's not wait. We will go straight to the first question, which is for Dr. Petja Nestorova. Petja, could you please, based on the overview you have from the Council of Europe as well as Greta, uh, name three initiatives that you think, um, initiatives or strategies that you think have been effective when it comes to uh, countering labor exploitation, please. Good morning and thank you for involving the Council of Europe in this important conference. Um, we have a convention on combating trafficking human beings in the Council of Europe with 48 uh, state parties. And trafficking for the purpose of labor exploitation has been very much at the focus of the monitoring carried out by, by Greta, the Council of Europe group of experts on uh, combating human trafficking. Um, I would like to highlight, first of all, uh, the example of Belgium, which has adopted over the years a comprehensive approach to addressing trafficking for labor exploitation. Uh, in the first place, they have at the policy level, through their national action plans, um, comprehensive measures to address this phenomenon. 
in sectors where uh, economic exploitation takes place, in particular the hospitality industry, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, as well as fishing. Um, in their third national action plan, for example, priority has been given to projects developed jointly with trade unions with a view to finding effective ways of transmitting information to um, migrant workers in order to prevent human trafficking. For example, developing brochures for asylum seekers, information on how to file work visa applications, and there is also a preventive system for domestic workers in diplomatic households with the procedure organizing their arrival and uh, an information leaflet. In the second place, Belgium has specialized um, bodies to address this issue. For example, there are specialized prosecutors in the investigation and prosecution of cases of trafficking for economic exploitation. And this is really important. There are two labor inspection services in Belgium, and they can carry out unannounced inspections in cooperation with the police and other supervisory bodies. Um, in this respect, uh, measures are taken against social dumping um, and also irregular situations which may amount to economic exploitation. And uh, labor inspectors have received training and are specialized in identifying possible cases of trafficking for labor exploitation. Belgium has a national referral mechanism, which is set out in a circular from the Ministry of Justice in, and the Prosecution, which is periodically updated and it governs the interaction between relevant bodies, including labor inspectors as well as NGOs, because in Belgium, the reception of victims of trafficking is um, managed by three specialized NGOs running reception centers. Pursuant to uh, the Belgium NRM, to the circular on multidisciplinary cooperation, when the police or labor inspectorate services detect a presumed victim of trafficking, they must inform the prosecution and contact one of the three specialized reception centers. Um, and the victim is referred to a reception centre, as well as reformed of all the, informed of all the possible assistance and protection. And there is an information leaflet in, 40, in uh, 28 languages, which is available. And finally, Belgium, because of all these uh, uh, mechanisms in place, is one of the countries with probably uh, the highest proportion of investigations, prosecutions and convictions in, for trafficking for labor exploitation. Over a five-year period, um, uh, earlier in the previous decade, 40% of the cases related to labor exploitation. So there have been convictions for trafficking in various sectors, construction, hotels, night shops, car washes, etc., domestic work as well. And several cases uh, have also involved legal persons who were sentenced, uh, with substantial fines imposed and imprisonment sentences also for the managers. So that was my first example. My second example relates to another area which is really addressing demand. And here I will be uh, mentioning a few things about the United Kingdom. Um, in the United Kingdom, since 2015, uh, there has been a comprehensive piece of legislation, the Modern Slavery Act, which has a section 40 and uh, 54, um, which requires businesses with a turnover of 36 million or more per year to provide uh, an annual statement explaining what steps they have taken to tackle trafficking and modern slavery in their supply chains. So to <clears throat> enable this reporting, the government has published guidance for companies about um, uh, reporting and how to carry out human rights diligence. And it has also launched a modern slavery assessment tool and the procurement policy note and guidance, which sets out how the government departments <clears throat> must take actions to ensure that human trafficking risks are identified and managed in the government supply chains. And this is an important point, which very few countries ha have, have addressed to my knowledge. Um, the government is now committed to extending the provision of the transparency in supply chains to public bodies, which have a budget threshold of uh, 36 million pounds so that uh, they are also covered by this provision. Uh, and the government itself published last year a modern slavery statement, sta setting out the steps taken to identify and prevent modern slavery in the central government supply, supply chains. And then you said a third example, if I have time, I would uh, very quickly refer to the Netherlands. Uh, and here I would say a few things about the important role of um, 
labor inspectors, the mandate, resources and training which they need in order to effectively address human trafficking. In the Netherlands, the inspectorate, uh, which has the acronym SZW, which was set up following a merger of the former labor inspectorate, the work and income inspectorate and the social, social security intelligence and investigation department, has really broad powers. It is competent to supervise adherence to labor regulations, as well as detecting and investigating labor exploitation and human trafficking cases under the supervision of the public prosecution. Um, they can carry out unannounced inspections at any time and can also enter private households, either with the permission of a judge or if there is a concrete information about the violation. And their budget was uh, recently increased by uh, 50 million um, euros in order to recruit more staff members and expand their operations. Um, so this is important in order to, to really uh, work effectively. I'm, I'm stopping with my examples here. Thank you so much, Petia. Uh, I think the overview of Greta is actually a very valuable uh, resource. And although we need to be critical, I think it's a good starting point to begin with the positive examples that need to be elaborated on. So I thank you a lot for these concrete examples. We move on with our next panelist, Dr. Van La Root. And Van La, Finland is an interesting uh, example in this context, I think, because Finland is seen as a very strong country in the fight against labor exploitation. In spite of this, Finland has decided to very carefully review its previous strategies against human trafficking and introduced a very thorough reform uh, on this topic. Can you please tell us what has Finland concluded in this process and uh, what should Finland do more or less of? Please, Fvella. Evenda, yes. please unmute your microphone. I'm sorry. Do you hear me now? Yes, we hear right. you very good. Thank you. All right. So, in the beginning of May, the Finnish government adopted a new action plan against human trafficking. The action plan is based on five strategic objectives and, and it, inclu in, it includes uh, five, 55 concrete measures. The objectives of the action plans are the following. Victims of human trafficking are reached and identified, and the detection of human trafficking is being promoted. Victims of human trafficking receive the help and support they need. In trafficking offenses, criminal liability is more effectively enforced. Combating trafficking in human beings is a multi-sectoral work and cooperation is being done also with civil society, such as businesses and NGOs. And anti-trafficking work is developed on the basis of knowledge and research. So first of all, we do efforts, uh, we make efforts to expose human trafficking and enforce criminal liability. So the detection of trafficking in human beings is being promoted with concrete measures. Finland is, is removing obstacles to the detection of human trafficking by developing legislation and official practices. The aim is that it is safe and realistic option for the victims to seek assistance, to apply for a residence permit and to report a crime to the police. Finland also assesses and introduces new residence permit legislation and makes it easier uh, for the victims to seek help. As we know, trafficking in human beings is a hidden crime that is less frequently detected through crime reports made by victims themselves. Therefore, Finland is developing its activities 
towards proactive reaching and detection of victims of human trafficking. The aim is, is that authorities central to the work against human trafficking know the phenomenon of trafficking and are able to do what they are supposed to do. We have established a new police unit to detect and investigate trafficking cases. We have also established a network of specialized prosecutors and also increased the number of labor inspectorates who monitor the terms and conditions of the foreign labor. Awareness of human trafficking and expertise will be increased by key authorities and other actors. These actions will be extended more strongly to those actors who work with particularly vulnerable groups and who have not yet been sufficiently involved in the fight against trafficking in human beings, such as school teachers, healthcare services and even aviation. The situation of pretrial investigation authorities, and in particular the police on trafficking in human beings, will be improved and their activities will be directed towards more effective crime prevention and investigation. Cooperation between authorities and pretrial and cooperation with prosecutors is being improved. We seek to improve the ability for the police officers to counteract human trafficking across the whole country. And the specialized unit, which has just been established in the police, will, for example, train the other police officers in Finland. The ultimate goal, of course, is that uh, we are able to prevent human trafficking more effectively. Finland helps all victims of human trafficking, irrespective of their resident status. Protecting the human rights of trafficking victims it is the cornerstone of the Finland's action against human trafficking. The aim is that the victims have access to assistance and that the authorities are able to meet their needs more equally throughout Finland. Cooperation with municipalities who provide services with trafficking victims who reside in Finland will be intensified. And at the same time, Finland seeks to prevent re-victimization, which is rather common among trafficking victims. Finland is also developing its legislation on victim assistance. We will weaken the link between assistance and criminal proceedings so that victims receive assistance regardless of the beginning, progress or outcome of the criminal proceedings as we see is required by the international obligations. And in connection with the law reform, the right of victims to safe and supported housing services will also be safeguarded. Finland sees that human trafficking is a problem that affects society as a whole. The work against trafficking in human beings is a cross-administrative entity that is taken forward in cooperation by several ministries and authorities. Finland considers it important that the specialization and expertise is in place. It is clear that we need specialized authorities in the police, labor inspection, prosecutors and social and health care. We need also businesses to combat human trafficking. Businesses are able to provide, for example, new and safe working opportunities for victims so that the victims can go on and have a way forward in their lives. We also link research activities closely to the development of anti-trafficking work. Finland initiates, initiated, initiated uh, and also actually has already initiated many research projects in order to get more information on how the legislation actually works in practice. And are there any needs for change in order to promote the detection of trafficking in human beings, to improve the situation of victims and the increased effectiveness of criminal liability? Trafficking in human beings is, is a constantly evolving phenomenon that is gaining new manifestations and ways. Finland is actively also monitoring and de uh, the development of the human trafficking phenomenon and is preparing to combat new or so far particularly unknown forms of human trafficking. Finally, I would like to say that there are no shortcuts to combating human trafficking. It is far from an easy thing to do. But what is certain is that no one can do it alone. Extensive societal commitment, 
goal-oriented work and some additional resources also are needed. We also need strong political will. Without that, we are not getting anywhere. We need also active NGO field and also active businesses, labor unions. And what is also important, we also need active media. It is also important to listen to the survivors in the process of planning and drafting new measures. And this is exactly what we have done here in Finland. It was very important to hear what they have to say. What is important to understand is that the work against trafficking in human beings protects the rights of those who trafficked, of course, and they closed ones. But it also promotes security, well-being and equality for all in the society. The action against human trafficking prevents a reduction in tax revenues and also it safeguards the opportunities for legitimate businesses and promote fair labour markets for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venla. Very thorough uh, presentation. I think you, I was glad you mentioned additional resources and political will because I think, in fact, most state authorities and organizations do want to cooperate more and they do want to do more. So the factors you mentioned are very um, important. We look forward to follow the developments in Finland. I don't think you will disappoint us. Um, we will begin with, or we will continue with Professor Zbigniew Lasochik. Professor Lasochik, I have uh, the question I have for you is that in your report authored within the CAPE project, you talk about three key factors which are lacking in the work against labor exploitation. And you are talking about awareness, shared responsibility for important social tasks and true partnership. Can you please explain what do you mean by this? Yes, thank you very much with, with great pleasure. But uh, first, let me thank the organizers for for very kind invitation. I'm so I'm so glad to be here at, at this conference. Um, as the time is uh, very short, I will um, use probably the simplest method of presentation. I will point out um, the most important observations of, of my research. But before I start, I would like to make two introductory remarks. Uh, first, in order to understand uh, what is happening in Poland or what is not happening or what doesn't work. You have to remember that Poland is it's quite special situation because we are, the, the Poland is country of um, origin, is destination country and, and transit country. And this fact presents to the state and the society long list of tasks. And the second remark, after two presentations, um, I'm allowing myself for a little bit of criticism because uh, I understand we we meet here to to say what not only what works but also what doesn't work and what we can fix um, together. But but let's start with with my uh, remarks. Um, as some of you may know, uh, combating human trafficking in Poland has been going on in 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 our country since uh, mid 90s. But the first case of forced labor was 2004. Uh, this means that a lot of uh, time has passed already. But in this period, only something that we can sort of tentatively call a system of combating human trafficking can be, had been created in, in, in our country. Um, on, on the other hand, taking into account the um, relatively long time and, and the special needs of Poland, which I expressed, I would say that this system is not um, is, is far from being perfect, let me put it that way, and is, is not effective. Um, to illustrate this, let, let me just say that in 2020, police in Poland in the, identified 14, one, four investigations, um, initiated uh, 14 investigations in all forms of modern slavery. And in 11 cases, they um, identify perpetrators. Um, but to answer your question more precisely, I would use um, sort of three perspectives, uh, political, legal and institutional and axiological. Um, let me start with politics. Um, 
I want to start with uh, awareness, but this time uh, awareness of the state authorities or state officials, but not citizens as norm as we normally do, because it is easy to say all citizens do know nothing about human trafficking. They are not interested. That's why the system is not working because that's normal procedure. As far as Poland is concerned, this is uh, actually true because the level of awareness of, of citizens is relatively low. But according to my research, the, the level of awareness of um, state institutions is even lower. Um, and I would like to provide you four indicators of, of this, um, this uh, statement. Um, number one, since 2003, when I'm sort of in this business, none of political leaders in Poland has ever said publicly that there is a problem of human trafficking or forced labor in Poland. Two, uh, combating forced labor has never been treated as a priority or at least, okay, an important task of the government in Poland. Three, um, the real intentions and, and commitment of the authorities are easily, um, is, are demonstrated and easily to be checked out um, in, in rather low level of national action plan, you can verify what I'm saying because it's uh, in most of the cases it's uh, available in English. And number four, which um, uh, Petya is were well uh, uh, aware of, uh, Paul has never been a member of Greta, either because nobody was notified or presented by the government or because those who were notified or presented did not represent the level of independence expected by the Council of Europe. The second level, the second perspective, if you like, is legal and institutional. Let me start with, with, with law. Um, in, in Poland, legislation about human trafficking is more than limited. But I identified four important gaps in the legislation uh, which prevent us from being act effective in combating forced labor. Um, first, um, it, there is lack of constitutional norm which would prohibit forced labor. Of course, there is uh, freedom of, of labor, and but no such provision. Second, uh, Polish labor code does not make it clear at any point that forced labor is prohibited. Third, um, there is no crime of forced labor in Polish criminal law, so there is no most useful and important instrument. And fourth, uh, Polish legal system does not contain a definition of forced labor. I, I expect that I accept the, the one um, from ILO convention. Now institutions. We have legal element, now institutions. The key agencies responsible for combating um, trafficking in Poland, like such police uh, prosecutors or border guards, have adapted their structure to, to the task. Um, either they created special units, networks of uh, coordinators uh, and so on. However, when it comes to forced labor, my research show that um, none of them introduced new internal regulations or special procedures that would apply to the effective elimination of, of, of the crime of forced labor. They all seem to assume that, oh, what works for human trafficking will work well for forced labor. This is not necessarily true. And for obvious reasons, special attention should be paid uh, to labor inspection, especially that it was mentioned by, in fact, all the speakers before. Uh, when collecting data for the report, I realized that uh, Polish labor inspection officially states and confirms that it does not deal with combating forced labor. And they add, because it is outside of, the, of their mandate, which from the legal point of view is true, by the way. But <laughs> does it make any change? Um, this this um, unusual fact can be confirmed by simple information. The whole institution, which is, um, according to my information, 2,500 people, has not identified any victim of forced labor in a recent time. And the third level of is, is axiology or public ethics, if you like. 
in Poland, there is no entity like, like Venla in, in, in Finland, uh, the body responsible for combating human trafficking or forced labor, for collecting data, for analyzing, for inspiring other institution coordination and so on and so forth. As a result, uh, my studies show that there is no integrated system of common actions engaging all possible actors such as the men the, the, those mentioned law enforcement, prosecutors, courts, labor inspection, NGOs, media. Of course, all these institutions cooperate with each other, but only to the extent they are obliged by national action plan. But let's, let's be straight and honest. There is no real partnership between them. A partnership, which I understand as three elements, association, division of tasks, and sharing of, of benefits. In ideal world, uh, the final aim of, of such partnership would be effective system to combat um, forced labor in Poland. All these institutions uh, consider their functions as autonomous, not complex and, and common. Uh, obviously, they always compete with each other. They do not trust each other. They try to shift responsibilities to another institution, but, but significant weakness, oh, the, the whole system is access to data. Each of these institutions collects data different way, plus they are not very keen to share the data. In general, I can say that lack of reliable sort of national database in Poland is significant weakness of the system, which by the way, was indicated many times, both by Greta, uh, Petya knows that, and US State Department in TIP report. Thank you very much uh, for being so brief, but uh, I try to um, to manage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lasuchik. I always enjoy hearing your takes on these issues. And yes, it's clear that uh, states have different uh, challenges and strengths when it comes to this work. I also noticed you mentioned that not all counter-trafficking uh, actions and measures should be general, Sh some should perhaps be uh, exploitation specific. And I would like to get back to this uh, at a later stage. Um, I think so far it's excellent that we, were, we are reminded that different measures and strategies are needed to some extent and that all strategies are, should be intended uh, to have the best interest of the victims in mind. And therefore, I would like on that note to proceed with our next speaker, uh, Mr. Hiab Johannes. Um, Hiab, being a survivor of uh, human trafficking yourself, what would you have wished that the state authorities, organizations involved in your case would have done more of or less of? Please, Hiab, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me start by telling you a little bit about myself first. I came from a country that for decades has imposed in open-ended national service on the entire population and engaged in constant exploitation of its human resources. It's part of my lived experience that I will never unlearn nor forget. In 2011, I left Eritrea for Sudan. Since then, I have survived detention, torture, and trafficking. While living in transit countries, I survived trafficking for ransom, labor exploitation, and potential organ harvesting. I began by telling you my story not because it's unique, but precisely because it's not. Many thousands of migrants die in transit countries from human trafficking. Others lose their dignity and humanity at the hands of exploitative employers or rogue state powers. At this moment, forced migrants are facing modern day slavery in Libya, in Israel, in Gulf states, and in many other countries. According to a survey conducted by the International Organization for Migration in 2016, more than 70% of migrants traveling to Europe through North Africa have been trafficked or exploited. The UN Migration, migration Agency states that over 20,000 migrants died attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea since 2014, and these figures do not even include deaths that occurred since March 2020. Globally, according to the IOM's Missing Migrant Project, over 42,000 migrants died in clandestine journeys regulated by organized criminals. These are not just numbers. 
these are people who have lost control over their bodies, embodiments and freedoms. These are children, women and men stripped of their dignity and exiled into egregious exploitation by traffickers, private actors and the most powerful political entity, the state. As is often said, labor, labor trafficking does not respect borders, but it exploits, it, it exploits social boundaries, socioeconomic backgrounds, legal status, gender stereotypes, and one's position in relation to the state. We know forced migrants are more susceptible to labor trafficking due to their precarious relationship with the state. Refugees and people seeking asylum are destined to face precarious lives, or perhaps even deaths, in torture camps regulated by traffickers, detention centers, at borders, in the sea, and in lifeless deserts. At personal level, I have dozens of relatives and friends who died in these previous journeys regulated by traffickers. I remember receiving a text message that says, born rightless, die rightless, from a childhood friend days before he sunk off the Italian island of Lampedusa, where about 400 people, mainly Eritreans, sunk in a matter of minutes on the 3rd of October 2013. The story of a young Eritrean woman, Johanna, who drowned off the coast of Lampedusa, with her newborn baby still attached to her, to her by its umbilical cord, still shocks me. These people are victims of labor trafficking, torture and arbitrary detention, first in their country of origin and then in transit countries. You ask me about why I, what I would have wished the involved authorities prioritized. My short answer is that I wish that the authorities had prioritized the human security of the involuntarily displaced people rather than the border security. Article, Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights states that no one shall be held and servited and that no one shall be left to perform forced labor. But I wonder whether these human rights conventions are upheld when it comes to involuntarily displaced people like myself. When survivors like myself raise such questions, the answer we get is that states are working hard to promote, manage it, and orderly migration. My lived professional and research experience, however, tells me otherwise. I want to remind that the problem of trafficking of forced migrants for labor exploitation is far more than just the individual stories. It's systemic, endemic, and structural. The reality of forced migrants is that there are no protective orders, but violent borders. There are no safe passages, but perilous journeys. There are no safety nets, but trafficking chains. These regimes of exclusive bordering and ordering of people seeking safety beg us to raise even more fundamental questions about the state policing access to who deserves the protection of the law, who belongs outside the scope of the law, and who counts as a human. When confronted with such difficult questions, we often talk about human rights, but I wanted to suggest to you that our analysis cannot be grounded on human rights without an understanding of how the human is differentially produced. When it comes to involuntarily displaced people, the degree to which one's legal and political status is recognized is inseparably linked to, the degree, to their degree of mortality, immobility, and precarity. We know people on the move are far more mortal than others. As, and as we know, labor trafficking thrives where the law is deferred or non-existent. Refugee survivors of trafficking are effectively placed outside the remit of the law. For them, as it was for myself, labor exploitation is a condition of life and an everyday crisis. Finally, I want you to imagine being forced to work in clandestine business of labor where your wallet is shrunk by an exploitative employer or authoritarian regime where you face inhuman bondage and solitary confinement. As a survivor, I have endured the visceral pain of being trapped in violent bondage. So I must speak against the utter devastation such inhuman bondage causes to millions of our fellow human beings. But as said, let us do the fighting together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Johannes. Very powerful remarks. I will try to let them speak for themselves. Um, I just wish everybody working with anti-trafficking issues and policies would join us today so they could hear uh, your remarks. Uh, thank you very much, 
You also mentioned that we need to broaden the understanding of labor exploitation, human trafficking, the migration aspects are very much there in front of us. Uh, this brings me to my next panelist, uh, Ms. Melita Grevska graham from the ICMPD. Melita, the International Center for Migration Policy Development has uh, carried out a number of researches uh, that focus on trafficking along the migration routes. Can you tell us if there are factors uh, that often make migrants more vulnerable uh, to labor exploitation and trafficking? Uh, if yes, which are these factors? Melita, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eddie for your question and for giving me the floor. And uh, let me thank uh, CBSS for inviting ICMPD to this event focusing on trafficking for, for the purpose of labor exploitation, a topic which um, is of course particular is of course of particular importance for um, ICMPD at the crossroads of our work on um, labor migration and mobility and on the fight against trafficking in human beings. In order to reach our objective today to revisit the, the concept of trafficking for the purpose of labor exploitation in relation to the particular situation of migrants and refugees along migration routes, it is important, uh, as he have also clearly pointed out, to zoom out of the narrow topic and situate this crime in the bigger migration picture. Indeed, the routes that people on the move are required to take become more dangerous as migration policies of the countries along the route and in destination become restrictive. The effects of the war and the need to move away from their homes to seek opportunities in the absence of alternatives in their communities of origin is placing people in a situation of uh, increased vulnerability to trafficking in persons that have in some cases resulted in actual trafficking cases. Along the routes, traffickers take advantage of people's vulnerabilities to exploit them while in transit or when arriving at their final destination, including for labor exploitation purposes. This has not, however, manif manifested itself in a significant increase in the identification of trafficking in mixed migration context and humanitarian crisis by the authorities. It is um, against this background and in light of the lack of data and knowledge on trafficking in this context that since 2014 ICMPD conducts empirical research on human trafficking in mixed migration context and humanitarian crisis. To reinforce the importance of today's event in a study published in 2019 and entitled The Strength to Carry On, we found that trafficking for labor exploitation is the most common form of exploitation affecting people traveling the route. In terms of profile, men and boys, and to a lesser extent, women and girls were found to be trafficked for labor exploitation in agriculture, as well as other sectors such as textiles, service industry, construction, and in begging. Women and girls are exploited in domestic and uh, care work. People often work for some time in intended transit countries like Libya, Turkey and Greece in order to earn enough to continue their journey and or to send uh, money to their family members. Because they generally do not have authorization for employment, they engage in irregular work, which can make people vulnerable to labor exploitation. However, Irregular and or exploitative work is often perceived as resilience, particularly by the people themselves, because earning some money is better than having no money at all. It is important to note that almost everyone who travels the routes uses migrant smuggling services. The exploitation of people on the move is very often linked to migrant 
smuggling situations. To a certain extent, then, the, the most common form of abuse of vulnerability for the purpose of exploitation is to take advantage of the fact that a person cannot travel regularly and desperately desires to reach their final intended destination. Vulnerabilities to labor exploitation arise not directly through interaction with smugglers, but as a result of the need to pay for their services. In these cases, people on the move may run out of money or go into debt in order to pay for the services, making them vulnerable to labor exploitation in particular. People need money and may work along the way to earn it in order to pay for smuggling services. Most indications of trafficking for labor exploitation, of labor exploitation in general, and of poor working conditions among the population under study involve adult men and uh, boys working in agriculture. Men and boys are significantly overrepresented among people using the routes. Many people interviewed consider that because so much attention is paid to women who are trafficked for sexual exploitation, men trafficked for labor exploitation are rarely identified. If women and girls we, we call it uh, uh, a paradox of vulnerability. If women and girls are particularly vulnerable to trafficking and other abuses in the context of the migration journey, then it follows that men and boys are more resilient. Yet uh, this uh, presumption of resilience among many state and NGO service providers may actually exacerbate men's and boys' vulnerabilities to trafficking and other abuses. Single adult men are a vulnerable group in this specific context precisely because they are considered the least vulnerable and because they are more likely to be, uh, to be victims of physical violence perpetrated by law enforcement, smugglers or other men. To conclude, from a certain standpoint, a number of findings and conclusions come as a confirmation of what was already known by practitioners, but not necessarily documented empirically. I nevertheless find it important to stress once more that this study demonstrated that the decision making of people on the move migrants and refugees as the victims and the strategies and the, and the strategies deployed by smugglers and traffickers as the criminals converge initially towards the same objective, defeating a restrictive migration regime in full acknowledgement of the life threatening risks they face. Therefore, the study could not by urge, but urge policymakers to firstly, expand alternatives for regular travel, allow for legal transit along migration routes, treat people with dignity in full compliance with human rights, including in relation to procedural rights during the asylum procedure. Second, teenage, uh, teenagers and adults in intended and de facto destination countries should have access to vocational training, studies and regular employment with measures to promote, to promote their labor market integration and opportunities for employment in migrant-led and migrant support organizations. And last, people who are working irregularly should have access to justice and protection if they suffer labor violations or labor exploitation. I will stop here now. Thank you very much, uh, Melita. I think one can always count on ICMPD to deliver us the latest up-to-date uh, reports and research when it comes to the nexus between migration and human trafficking. Uh, we thank you a lot for this. Also interesting, uh, as briefly touched on before, you mentioned this constant uh, 
um, reproduction of the idea of men being much more resilient than female victims of trafficking may imply that these individuals are not to be seen or identified as victims. I think this is something we really need to bear in mind uh, today. Thank you, Milita. I would like to continue uh, by returning to uh, Dr. Petri, Petja Nestorova. Um, Petja, in your uh, introductory remarks, you mentioned successful strategies, but I would like to know, without singling out any specific uh, states, of course, are there any um, strategies or initiatives that you have identified that are intended to counter labor expectation, but that are not so effective or even counterproductive, perhaps? Please, Petja. Yes, of course, not everything is uh, rosy. And um, listening to the other panelists, of course, um, I would be naive to say that what we identify as positive examples uh, is always working well. Uh, you know, even positive examples may have downsides. But now I will mention a couple of uh, examples where uh, the authorities uh, basically are getting it wrong. And this has been mentioned in uh, Greta's reports. The first example is from Ireland, where in uh, 2016, following reports of abuses of migrant workers on uh, Irish fish, uh, fishing, uh, fishing vessels, the government set up uh, what, was, what is known as the atypical working scheme for sea fishers to facilitate the employment of fishers on boats of 15 meters or, or over in length. And uh, this scheme provides that um, the employees will be guaranteed. And here I'm talking about non-European economic area uh, employees, uh, of course. Uh, so the scheme provides that they will be guaranteed at a minimum, the national minimum wage uh, and statutory terms and conditions in accordance with national law. Um, the applications must be made by the employer who has a suitable vacancy and has identified an employee to fill that vacancy. So the scheme started being applied, as I said, in 2016. The Labour Inspectorate of Ireland, uh, the WRC, uh, carried out hundreds of inspections of fishing vet vessels in order to um, survey uh, the application of the scheme uh, with interviews of crews, etc. And several prosecutions were launched against the vessel owners because of violations observed. And there were also several cases of identity identified victims of human trafficking where investigations were launched. Um, now, Greta in its uh, second report on Ireland uh, expressed criticisms about this scheme on several counts. Uh, first, the employer must support the fisher's application for a visa, which creates a dependence on the employer. And if the employment relationship breaks down, this places the fisher in a vulnerable position. The number of permits which are issued under this scheme uh, is small in relation to the total number of workers in the fisheries industry. Uh, and the, those who are without permits accept to work over time without pay for fear of being discovered and deported from Ireland. The International Transport Federation, ITF, uh, got very much involved into this uh, um, case in Ireland. Uh, it carried out itself inspections and found numerous breaches of the scheme. Uh, which it reported to the Labour Inspectorate. Uh, according to the ITF, less than 10% of the 100 fishers with whom they were in contact were covered by the scheme. And those who were covered were apparently uh, obliged to have the cost uh, for this, of the scheme being deduced from their wages. So the International Transport Federation actually brought a case uh, to the High Court of Ireland seeking an intermediate, immediate sorry, moratorium uh, on the scheme uh, and uh, seeking to have it uh, reviewed. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, also with the involvement of um, uh, the Irish uh, um, Equality and Human, Human Rights Commission, it was decided in 2019 uh, that the scheme will be re reviewed. So, so the scheme now has uh, different conditions. There is flexibility for the non-EEA fishermen to move to other vessels. Um, the previous employer cannot uh, veto such a move. 
Um, and uh, there is uh, also interagency co collaboration between the labor inspectorate uh, the, and the police in order to uh, combat exploitation on um, fishing vessels and also promotion of great awareness uh, amongst the fishermen of their rights and entitlements. Um, and then I wanted to mention that, uh, and this is really a follow up on what in particular Milita was saying, um, um, the fact that uh, many countries um, have provisions which make it uh, a crime, an offence to, to be working irregularly in a country uh, can be counterproductive when it comes to combating human trafficking. For example, in the UK, the Immigration Act of 2016 made it a criminal offence to work in the UK without required documentation. And it also made it legal for the government to seize wages from undocumented workers as proceeds of crime. So the offence of illegal work, uh, according to Greta, has implications for the identification and protection of victims of trafficking. The obstacles in the, the identification of victims of trafficking who are irregular migrants are compounded by the absence of secure reporting and complaints mechanisms for migrants with insecure or undocumented immigration status. Government agencies are report, encouraged to report migrants working without required authorization to the immigration enforcement authorities. Um, there was a, a recent case in 2020, uh, the Court of Appeal found that it was dis disproportionate to confiscate the value of wages where the underlying work was legitimate and properly performed, regardless of the fact that the person was undocumented. And this case uh, represents an important step in ensuring that irregular migrants who might be victims of trafficking are identified as victims instead of being considered as criminals. Um, other countries have established quotas for work permits, which are very low. And for example, domestic work is excluded from the quota system, as in Italy. Um, and uh, uh, all this underlines the importance of enabling legal migration in order to reduce the vulnerability to trafficking. And there is actually a, a provision in the Council of Europe Convention, uh, Article 5 on prevention, which obliges states to take appropriate measures to enable migration to take place legally. Um, and this is also linked to something else, the need to separate immigration enforcement functions from labor inspectorate functions. Uh, this is not always the case. In many countries, labor inspectors are also immigration enforcement um, officials. This is uh, what I wanted to say at this stage. Thank, thank you very much, Petya. Very concrete examples. Um, I would like to go from the Council of Europe and stay on this sort of macro uh, level by continuing with Professor Lasochik. Uh, my second question for you is, the European states have very different challenges and uh, strengths. We have already established this uh, by now. But how would you characterize the um, overall political will uh, in the EU to counter trafficking for labor exploitation, please. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, quite difficult question uh, because um, here and there um, there is some criticism about um, European Union. Um, and there is no, in fact, open debate on that. Uh, it's a pity that Mr. Ronidi is not with us um, for this discussion. Um, but what, what I can offer you is an uh, opinion of someone who is a little bit outside of so-called mainstream. Um, and I'm also a citizen of the country of a little bit of special status in, um, in European Union and in Council of Europe. But never mind, I will uh, share with you a um, few comments. Uh, my general observation is that um, looking at European Union for almost 20 years, I mean, in this uh, human trafficking business, uh, my opinion is that European Union did many good things, but in the recent time or recent years, it has um, in some sense abdicated as a leader in the fight of, of human trafficking in the European Union. Again, I will use very simple indicators to, to explain, to show what I mean. Uh, first one is historical. It is quite common opinion um, that EU has failed to ensure proper implementation of the directive. 
Uh, and I can give you a very good example of Poland. Um, the directive requires, as you know well, to appoint special rapporteurs or allows to create uh, equivalent mechanisms. Poland obviously chose the latter option and, and uh, established so-called interministerial team, a body that had no chance to, to, be, to, to, to succeed. But okay, that was politics, that was political decision. I'm fine with that. However, in 2019, Polish government abolished even this body, which was clear violation of Article 19 of the directive. And my question is, was there any reaction of the EU? At least I'm not aware of that. Maybe there was. Uh, second uh, indicator is a little bit related to today. Um, I, I think, according to my judgment, one of the problems in combating human trafficking in Europe is lack of balance between well, um, successful Western Europe and rest of the continent, not always that successful. Uh, as a result, the public debate is uh, under a strong, not strong, but dominance of Western point of view, which is absolutely fine for, for many reasons, uh, enough to say that we all learned uh, from Western European countries at the very beginning. But, but there are also negative consequences. And let me give you only one example. Uh, recently, uh, at various conferences, I heard question, are we spending, well, quite big money we have in Europe to combat human trafficking? We, we heard uh, amounts in other presentations. But my question are different. Do we share this money fairly? Do we know how much individual countries spend on combating human trafficking? Are we happy with that? Uh, let's look again at, at my country. Uh, Poland is one of the EU member states, and still, but who knows, uh, with population almost 40 million people and many problems with human trafficking. And imagine that we spend yearly equivalent of 260,000 euros for the entire anti-trafficking program support for victims, prevention, education, training, whatever. Uh, over a year ago, I conducted research on human trafficking in the US, where this amount of money is considered as a medium or small size, a research, uh, research grant, small, uh, medium size research grant. Imagine, I don't know, is, is European Union happy with that? Is, is aware of that? Is European Union happy with that? And the third is about future. Again, recently, um, Union has um, published a new strategy, which is very good um, and, and fine. But, but there is, again, some criticism about this document. Mostly people say that it is written in such a way that there is something for everyone. Agreeing partly with that, I would like to highlight only one element. Uh, reading the strategy, but, but mostly, but especially press releases where something is underlined, I would say that the document is focused on, on reducing demand or fighting or reducing demand. As we well know, it is purely political issue because we know well that several studies also financed by the EU, I participated in, in one of them, clearly showed that too much focus on, on, on demand is not a very effective way to combat human trafficking and, and forced labor. And, and finally, as academic and, and university professor, I have one remark about research. Um, EU spends a lot of money for research, which is extremely important, extremely good. But let's look at the problem from a slightly different perspective. Grants of the European Union are getting bigger and bigger. In some programs, even 5 million euros. Also, um, bigger and bigger consortia had to apply. Um, so far, it, so imagine if there is a money, uh, 5 or 10 million euros, only one or two applicants can be awarded, sometimes out of 30 or 40 applying. So frustration is high. Is this 
good policy of the European Union. I understand it's good policy of that administration, which according to my judgment has a little bit less work, but I don't think this is what we have to struggle for. So just a um, few remarks from the top of my head, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lasicic. Um, Venla Rot, uh, political will. Again, Finland is now used as a positive example in my question. And please noting that all countries have challenges when it comes to implementing regulations and strategies against trafficking. But I would really like to know, how do you explain the political will in Finland? Obvious, there is a presence of political will. Where does it come from? Is it from NGO level? Uh, is it from uh, state agencies working with this? How did this political will emerge? Venla, please. Thank you. Well, from a lot of, for many, many, many kind of uh, ways it came. So, uh, first of all, uh, the 19, uh, 2019, we formed a new government in Finland. Um, and that's a multi-party government. And uh, uh, I have to say that this government has taken human trafficking more seriously probably than, than the earlier governments, I would say. And the reasons for that, uh, that are probably many. First of all, uh, anti-trafficking issues and the, the phenomenon of human trafficking has gained uh, public awareness, uh, maybe more than ever before. Uh, but also I would like to say that what has been really important is that uh, we have had institutions, we have had research, we have had uh, monitoring, uh, we have had uh, pull, uh, like a um, link to the, the, the parliament already Previously, for example, the National Rapporteur reports directly to the Parliament and, and also uh, focuses on, on those drawbacks that, you know, the National Rapporteur is, is facing uh, in their work. Um, we, so we have involved pol policymakers already like 10 years. Uh, it takes time. Uh, no, nothing like is... Nothing is easy, let's say so. So it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it, it demands a lot of uh, kind of a preparation in order to get that kind of political will and the politicians actually get uh, enough information in order to make decisions on what is needed. So we have also, you know, we have strong NGOs and uh, they have been really active in the field. Uh, um, they have been active also in, in the in kind of a, uh, pointing out uh, challenges, but also they have been active in, in uh, um, um, giving recommendations of what should be done. And what I also find very important is that we have had very active uh, labor inspectorate. Uh, we have had uh, active police officers, prosecutors. Uh, so as I said, no one is able to do this alone. So we need each other. And, and I think that this, this comes from, should I say, also from the grassroots level. So what we actually see, so what is, you know, seen there, uh, it has a huge impact uh, of how it is in a way, how it reaches the political agenda in the end. So it doesn't come from, uh, from you know, from, uh, from nowhere, but it comes from, from active involvement, active work that people are doing and and it takes time but at at you know now we now we are on the on the right track i think thank you thank you so much venla uh institutions are in place this seems to be key in order to have a successful work against trafficking and practice i would like to go back to you uh melita grevska graham uh, I would like to continue a bit more on this migration aspect uh, of trafficking. I think this is an emerging uh, trend and connection that we are seeing more and more of. 
You briefly mentioned this before, but in your view, to what extent do migration policies affect the presence of trafficking? And I do not mean only negatively, but also positively. Um, can you please explain how do these factors impact uh, the presence of human trafficking? Um, yes, um, several answers to uh, to this question can be found in the study I mentioned earlier, which um, uh, in addition to uh, looking into factors of vulnerability, also identified uh, specific factors that uh, contribute to enhancing the resilience of uh, migrants and refugees to different risks and dangers that they are exposed to. Um, and what we found out is that resilience uh, and vulnerability are related to legal status and access to protection. Uh, two examples, uh, let's say, in this regard. The first one is about conditions of travel and entry. If a person was granted regular entry to an EU country, such as through a refugee resettlement program, community sponsorship program, a tourism work or study visa or family reunification procedure, um, then they are significantly more resilient as they avoid the need to use migrant smuggling services and they avoid the journey completely, which is full of risks and dangers, as, um, as it was stated before. And the second thing is about administrative status and uncertainty. Resilience is determined to a significant extent by whether people are granted refugee status or some other form of international protection or legal resident status, how long the procedure takes and what the conditions are for them while awaiting the decision and after being granted or refused status. It became evident from the research findings that there is a need of, for a paradigm shift in how trafficking, refugee, migration, child protection, as well as labor policies are viewed in terms of access to protection. Um, well, while policymakers and practitioners might see themselves as working in distinct fields on a specific topic, the human beings in need of protection do not always fall under one single clear-cut category. People on the move are vulnerable because of their need to move and because this means they, along the journey, along the route, they often simultaneously hold multiple legal statuses. They may be asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, irregular migrants, or trafficked people. So in order to avoid um, a situation where such girls and boys, women and men, fall through the cracks of uh, state policy and legislative frameworks just because they do not fit one into one specific category, the anti-trafficking stakeholders must collaborate closely with the um, stakeholders working on economic integration and sociocultural integration schemas, internal displacement, international protection, child protection, irregular migration, and also migrant smuggling. A positive uh, recent development in this regard is the, um, is the newly adopted EU strategy on combating trafficking in human beings for the period 2021 and 2025. So the first important aspect is that the strategy puts a strong focus on the interlinkages with other policy uh, areas and instruments like the EU strategy to tackle organized crime, the EU uh, strategy on the rights of the child, 
uh, on victims' rights, on uh, for the rights of uh, persons with disabilities, and the new pact on migration and asylum. And of course, the forthcoming EU action plan against migrant smuggling. I can state that this approach is very close to ICMPD's line of thinking and the way we work. ICMPD advocates for streamlining the anti-trafficking efforts across other thematic areas. So to make sure that interventions therein do not increase their target population's vulnerability to human trafficking. However, we welcome this new development, but we still need to see how such linkage and alignment of the anti-trafficking strategy standards with other instruments will be ensured in practice. Um, in addition to the legitimate aim of combating people, smugglers and irregular migration, the policymakers should also keep in mind that we all need must do justice to the fundamental values of the European Union and the international legal framework and find better ways to ensure protection of those who, who really need it. Um, from the interviews that we conducted, uh, that, uh, we found out that there is a misperception about how to mitigate the vulnerabilities. Uh, it can certainly not be done just by the eradication of migrant smuggling, because this will not eliminate the pre-existing vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities of being smuggled are not simply caused by the smugglers but also result from the actions of other groups of individuals, the policies and practices applied during different periods um, in different places and from the overall context of uh, smuggling. So to conclude, we need to continue to mainstream anti-trafficking efforts into broader migration legislation as well as policy and actions. We need to ensure that all legislation, policy and actions, particularly in the areas of asylum, preventing irregular migration and migrant smuggling and border management are assessed to ensure that they do not increase vulnerabilities to human trafficking. And for this, we need to urgently review and revise any policy or legislative measure found to have an um, an adverse effect on vulnerability to trafficking and or actual incidents of trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Melita. Don't stream, do streamline the human trafficking work more and don't view it as an isolated issue. Uh, this has been established several times today and I think this is very important. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question before a short Q&A. Uh, and my final round of question goes to uh, Mr. Hiab Johannes. Um, we have heard examples so far of legislation, migration, cooperation, partnerships and trust, and also awareness. I would like to ask you, Hiab, Based on your experience, how should we, as state agencies and authorities, as well as organizations, how should we involve, involve survivors of human trafficking uh, in our strategies and efforts uh, against labor exploitation? How should we do this concretely? Please. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to reflect on the need for survivor engagement and survivor voice integration in policy making, practice and research without going into too much detail. I wanted to start by stating what I think we cannot afford to do and what we must do to engage with survivors and integrate their voices. First, we cannot afford to be in a situation where lawmakers do the planning and implementation of policies, politics and ethics and even activism. We should allow survivors to enlighten us and even design such structures. Second, we cannot afford to be in a situation where journalists do all the reporting and researchers all the academic work. We must have survival reporters and researchers. Third, we cannot leave the job of investigating crimes of labor trafficking to police. We must engage with survivor leaders, their families, their communities, and their local services. Lastly, we should not leave the task of 
leave the healing, recovering, and reintegration of survivors to the survivors, experts, and professionals. We must have acting and interacting partners, including the survivors, the communi their communities, the state and non-state institutions, all working together. The yearning for a world free of trafficking requires a, a collective effort. We are called upon to create a protective shield around the most vulnerable people in our communities and address the root causes of all forms of trafficking. This cannot be done without survivors. So we must engage with survivors, for example, by one, empowering community center survivor-led initiatives. This may involve working with informal community groups and other outreach services. Two, integrating survivor-centered approaches within law enforcement institutions such as creating safe and survivor-friendly environments and reporting systems, embedding survivor leadership within service sector, such as creating survivor leaders as, amb as ambassadors in their communities, survivor leaders in schools and university student unions as well, promoting access to remedies. Remedies must involve a recovery plan and rehabilitation strategy, and it must also involve restoring and maintaining survivors' human dignity through compassion, empathy, intersubjective human-to-human -human relationality, and sharing experience and expertise. And no one does this better than the survivors. In short, victims should not have to remain victims. Their victimhood must end, and their human dignity restored. Survivors should not have to remain survivors their survivorship must in, and they must be trained and supported to be leaders. To this effect, survivor engagement requires going be beyond the tokenism of inclusion and creating a safe environment where survivors are treated as the authors and narrators of their stories, perspectives, and visions for more sustainable solutions, where survivors are at the center of service provision and policy making, where survivors are involved in the ethics and the politics of anti-trafficking policies, practice, and research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yab. I hope that everybody participating today took notes uh, during your remarks and that today will be the starting point of involving survivor organizations and survivors to a much larger extent than we have done before. Thank you very much. We would now move on to the last portion of this panel, which is the Q&A. And my first question goes to Petya Nestorova. Awareness is still, awareness is still low among the European states, even though progress has been made. Why are, why is the awareness, I'm sorry, why is the awareness still low, even though progress has been made? Petia, please, Nestorova. Well, we are working with um, 47 countries in Europe, and uh, I can say there are quite a lot of variations amongst them. Um, some are at the higher speed when it comes to this uh, issue, and others have woken up in the last few years. So, so the, this is one reason also why awareness varies between between countries. Um, then. Maybe there is a difference when it comes to uh, typical countries of origin and then countries of destination. I say typical because no, no one is really exclusively only one or the other. Um, in countries of origin, awareness has focused on warning uh, potential migrants, migrant workers, of uh, risks that they might be uh, running across uh, along their journeys and where they can turn to help. So the focus has been uh, through um, various campaigns when there's seasonal work, uh, people who travel usually in the summer or during the holidays, summer holidays when uh, there is tourism, etc. Uh, and this, this has really uh, focused on, on, on this particular group. Uh, maybe omitting uh, other categories of, uh, of people who should be who should be informed. Then in countries, as I said, typical countries of destination, uh, the awareness raising campaigns, of course, uh, have had uh, maybe different angles. Um, and uh, I see that there are a lot of initiatives through videos, uh, websites, uh, posters in the streets, etc. Uh, the impact of these awareness uh, campaigns is very rarely measured. 
Uh, I've seen only a few cases where really there was a proper impact management uh, measurement, which was uh, uh, already programmed, planned before the campaign. Uh, and I, I believe quite a lot of money is spent, of course, on the awareness raising campaigns. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you may be aware of the risks that you're running. But if this is your only chance sometimes to, to survive, to, to get a job, uh, you know, if you're an um, unemployed worker somewhere in Eastern Europe, you will take up dodgy offers, even if you if you know that uh, it might be risky. So awareness is only it's not a, a panacea. It is only part of the part of the uh, of a comprehensive uh, strategy that we must have uh, on prevention. Uh, and then we need awareness amongst the policymakers in Parliament, uh, in uh, well, government. Um, civil, trade unions, of course, they, they, they have to be aware. Not, not in all countries I have seen trade unions really, really looking at the issue and being, being concerned by it. Um, so, yeah, there are many areas in which we, we need to work. I read in the EU strategy, by the way, uh, that uh, they're planning to do a, a European Union-wide uh, campaign. Uh, so uh, I don't know how this will be designed, how it will work. In the Council of Europe, we are really trying to mobilise uh, political uh, will to uh, address this issue. And we'll be starting in the autumn the preparation of a committee of ministers recommendation to all the Council of Europe member states on combating trafficking for labor exploitation. So I hope that this will uh, raise awareness of all these complex issues at the policy uh, makers level. Thank you. Good remarks. Yes, we need awareness, but we also perhaps need to discuss what type of awareness and at what situations and looking at the context. A very good remark. We have one question for Venla Roth. It is, can you describe the media attention to this issue, I assume, labour exploitation in Finland? Are the media generally interested in human trafficking for labour exploitation? Venla, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, well, I would say that that media attention has increased uh, during the last couple of years, I would say. Uh, um, I think um, we have had some media which have been rather interesting, interested in, 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 in writing and, and documenting uh, trafficking. But now it seems that this 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 has this has really increased a lot, and it's a good thing. I think uh, involving media and that the media actually takes this on board is really important. I think, and it can. I don't know. I, I think that probably it is. It can be so that that media is is actually doing the the, the public awareness campaign better than than. Than us, so so in that sense, I, I think that it's it's a good thing. Um, for example, in our action plan in Finland, which was adopted just one month ago, we did not include awareness campaign in that uh, uh, national plan of action. Um, we think that it, depending on the people you want to reach. Uh, you have to, to give different kinds of information uh, to different kinds of people. Uh, you know, that kind of a awareness raising campaign, what is the target group really? Uh, if it is the, the, the common people, I think the media probably works even better. Uh, they are able to also to, um, of course, uh, they have uh, written also uh, about uh, individual uh, individual victims of human trafficking and their stories, and and these these you know these victims have been willing to do that, which is which is of course great, but in a sensitive matter. So so I think it is it has been really beneficial for us that that we have active media here in Finland. Thank you, Venla. Interesting connection uh, or describing the media's role here as awareness raising. Uh, I think this is that would be a very helpful as 
most uh, people will never encounter human trafficking themselves and the first source of information uh, when it comes to this topic is usually the media. So uh, thank you for that remark. Dear panelists, uh, we need to wrap up um, before we move on to the break and our next second panel. I thank you deeply for taking your time uh, to participate in this uh, panel and for giving your an very analytical uh, and thoughtful remarks. Um, let's take with us, please, today that we should never get stuck on old, ineffective strategies, uh, but rather recognize the flaws that we all have in our current systems and do something about them. Uh, one step could be to initiate partnerships uh, with human trafficking survivors organizations like we discussed a bit earlier. Uh, and please do that from now on if you have not done so. We will go for a short break, but please do not miss our next panel, which will answer the question, do we risk facilitating human trafficking for labor exploitation without knowing it? Uh, during which you will be in the hands of the moderator Anna Ekstedt, who is the Swedish uh, government's ambassador at large for combating trafficking in persons. Thank you so much and see you very soon. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. We are now ready to move on to the second panel of the day, where we'll be discussing labor exploitation and the recruitment of uh, migrants uh, for labor exploitation. Labor exploitation is a phenomena we associate often with criminal individuals and networks and how they unscrupulously, uh, unscrupulously companies that actively are breaking environmental law and also labor law in order to exploit labor uh, victims. Uh, however, and we also see, we know that exploitation of labor uh, victims are of course uh, uh, harmful both for society at large and for the individuals involved. However, we also see the fact that uh, victims are, uh, companies do end up in situation where they actually are uh, exploiting victims of trafficking without knowing it. They can end up in schemes of labor trafficking, even though they're actually not involved in the trafficking themselves, such as it could be exploitation hidden in, in the supply chains or exploitation within uh, sort of uh, subcontracting chains. Sub subcontracting change. We also see all the, all the time that traffickers are updating their modus of operandi in order to exploit our legal systems and also find new ways to recru recruit victims and lure victims of trafficking into labor exploitation. And one aspect playing an important role in labor exploitation is the recruitment of labor migrants. We also saw from the latest UN Global Report that a high number of victims for labor exploitation in the world today are actually migrants. So therefore we have today with us an excellent panel which will look into the recruitment of migrant workers and labor law. Do we actually risk facilitating forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation without knowing it? And I'm happy to introduce the panel that we have, all the experts that we have with us today. We have Dr. Julia Moroskevich, uh, an experienced researcher and is also a practice manager at Trilateral Research and she teaches at the University of Amsterdam Politics, Psychology, Law and Economics College. And furthermore, we have Anina Jokinen, uh, who is a senior program officer at the European Institute for Crime Prevention and Control, affiliated to the United Nations, Hoini, in Helsinki. Mr. Jokinen has uh, extensive experience on working on international criminal policy uh, issues with focus on human trafficking and labor exploitation. We also have with us Dr. Magnus Falk, who is the head of unit in international affairs at the Swedish Work Environment Agency. Magnus is also active as a Swedish representative in the European Labour Authority. And last but not least, we have Philip Schwertmann, uh, who heads the Arbeit und Lebens Migration and Decent Work section. He supervises counselling offices for migrant workers in the Berlin and the Brandenburg region, as well as the National Center, Service Centre for Labour Exploitation, Forced Labour and Human Trafficking. I would like... 
Uh, I would like to start by asking the first question to Julia. Uh, Julia, uh, you have authored a report within the framework of the CAPE project that CBSS has been conducting, a report on labour exploitation in Poland specifically. And you have, of course, several interesting findings within that report. Uh, one that really caught my attention was the relationship between a country's economy and its status, as, its status as a country of origin. So, for example, looking at Poland, for example, could you then please share your thoughts why Poland, uh, as a country with a strong and growing GDP, still is a country where uh, victims are being recruited for labour exploitation? Please. Yes, of course. Uh, and allow me first to start off uh, by thanking for the invite to this co great conference. I've already had heard uh, many interesting insights uh, and I look forward to the afternoon. Uh, and turning now to your question, which I think is extremely important. We all know that, you know, in times of austerity or in times of cuts, uh, there's unemployment, increase in unemployment, there's increase in poverty, increases in uh, discrimination, all which in turn contribute to uh, increase of vulnerable persons and, and, and therefore increasing the pool of people uh, that uh, exploiters and human traffickers uh, can pry on. Uh, and so this, this is all known. But what about in times of prosperity and, and you know, in times of when there's growth and there's investment? Uh, and times that many countries, such as Poland, have been experiencing, certainly up until uh, the pandemic. You know, many countries have, were showing quite a high GDP growth, particularly in that um, central eastern uh, region of Europe. And I think um, the key question really is, it's not looking at growth per se, uh, it's looking at what is that country in investing in? What is it putting value on? So when it comes to a country like Poland, there was, there's been a lot of investment in the farming communities, in pensions, and to some extent into education. Certainly a lot of investment into promoting family and encouraging women to have uh, many children. But there seems to be no investment or very poor investment in the most vulnerable uh, persons and pushing those vulnerable persons even further and further into the margins of, of society, making them um, invisible, leaving them with no safety nets. Uh, in my report, I particularly focused on two groups, uh, and these are groups that I um, came to know through working for many years at a safe house in the UK for victims of human trafficking for forced labor. They were Polish males, uh, and these were predominantly uh, individuals who started their exploitation journey as, as homeless persons and or as persons who had just left correctional facilities, prisons. Um, and, and I found that it was in these groups uh, that there was lack of investment from the state, that they, they, they felt they had no, no help from anybody. Um, and one victim even told me after leaving a correctional facility, you know, I, I had no plan. I had no idea what to do with my life. And suddenly somebody turns up and, you know, gives me a plan, gives me an idea. And yes, it sounded dubious and uh, not very safe, but what else was I going to do? It was either the streets where I was getting no help or, or it was this. And that was the story, I would say, of about 90% or so of the, vic the victims of forced labor uh, that I worked with. Uh, so that's one particular issue. There's just not enough investment when it comes to welfare to providing safety nets for those most vulnerable. Uh, and that also comes a little bit into this notion that we know of the ideal victim, right? it's very nice to help this ideal victim that fits the poster image. But when we have homeless males or males who's, who have just left uh, correctional facilities or who are waiting to spend, um, to have to serve their sentence, it seems to be less popular uh, for, for the government to, to, be, to be helping those um, individuals. Um, the other just thing, I, if, I, if I still have some time to mention about uh, despite there being economic growth, is there's also not enough investment in countries in Poland. And uh, Professor Lasochik already touched on that, on, on, on uh, assistance to NGOs that then in turn assist victims. Uh, Professor Lasochik quoted the figure of about 250,000, compared that to the US. I compare it to the UK, which invested in 2016, 2017, 15 million euro um, into its victim care, which is a, such a massive difference in Poland. And yes, of course, the UK is a richer country. It's a bigger country. Perhaps it has a bigger problem with human trafficking. But nevertheless, that, that, that difference is quite shocking. Um, and so really to, to, to kind of an answer, uh, to summarize my answer to your question, um, I think the most important thing is that even though when there is economic growth, it's important to think about what we are doing with that growth. And it's important to invest in the most marginalized, the most disadvantaged, vulnerable, and especially those who don't fit that poster image. And, and why do we do that? It's to 
enlarge those people's choices of, of, of life so that when a dubious offer does come, they have the ability to say, you know what, no, because I know, for instance, there's help for me uh, elsewhere. Um, and that's going to not only hopefully decrease human trafficking, but it's going to create more just, equitable and inclusive societies. Uh, and therefore goes to that thing that we, we've been speaking about earlier today, about seeing human trafficking as a holistic picture. So it's not enough just to say, let's have a national action plan on human trafficking. We need to join it up with all the other areas, all the other areas where we look at vulnerabilities uh, and, and welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much for your solid answer. And um, I think it's very important also what you mentioned, the fact that we actually need to bring the vulnerable groups along in, the, in a uh, development in society in order for them not to end up in exploitive situations. And I think that's extremely important now during the COVID-19 pandemic that we have, that it has hit them sort of different groups in society differently. So thank you very much for pointing that out. I actually do have a follow up question on that. And which also you've already talking about the fact that you have certain vulnerable groups that maybe don't fit into sort of the perfect victim scenario, like you mentioned, homeless people, people who already might have a criminal record, etc. Uh, but could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? What can we actually do to reach this group and also give the, so they, they, that they, the fact that they are entitled to being properly identified as victims if they are victims of trafficking? And also if we say that there are no perfect victims, do we have perfect traffickers in that sense? How do we sort of identify the perfect trafficker? How do we identify the traffickers? Thank you. Uh, another great set of questions. So looking at those um, those victims, you know, again, I'd like to kind of tell you the story of uh, a very common story that I, I encountered. Um, it was an individual had a number of problems which led him to a life of crime. Um, and on leaving prison, um, you know, he was recruited within, literally within hours. Um, he was then offered a, a job a, a in the UK, which, which he took, like I said, because there was no other choice, uh, and then entered a situation of forced labor. Now, we could see this, this story of this kind of victim as a linear, linear story. You know, he's vulnerable recruited, forced labor, it's a straight path. But I think this is where a lot of the error, uh, errors come when we address human trafficking. We see them as linear. We don't see this as, as, as a big part of a bigger uh, holistic problem. What we must kind of understand is that a number of elements facilitated that victim to becoming a victim or being a potential victim. First of all, there was the lack of treatment for, for his alcohol and substance uh, abuse prior to him embarking on a like, lack of crime. Again, there was not enough help. Then when on leaving prison, he had no, like I said before, he had no plan for himself. There was no nowhere for him to look for work. Getting work was very hard, not only with a criminal le record. There was there was no no housing, and, and of course there was also his perception that if you know if he goes to England, there the welfare system is better and th things will take care of him. So there were a number of elements that came together throughout his life, bef much before the trafficking journey, that I think we need to think about um, when we when we address uh, human trafficking. So it's really important that when we when countries are writing those national action plans on trafficking. They ask their colleagues who are doing national action plans on homelessness or who are looking at uh, other vulnerable groups. Look, what are you doing? Why don't we work together? Our plans need to come, come together. It all fits part of the same puzzle and, and they certainly should not be drafted or implemented in isolation. Um, as to your second question about the ideal trafficker, I recently just wrote an article about this and hopefully it will be published soon. But if we cast our minds back to 1986 when Niels Christie wrote about the ideal victim, he, he also mentioned about the ideal perpetrator being a bad, ruthless, unknown, some, some scary uh, offender in the background. And yes, of course, we, we have those in trafficking very much. But we also must remember that not, they're not always alien monsters. They're, all, they're not always unknown, particularly also to the victims. That, that there's, there's quite a lot of overlap between the traffickers, including in forced labor uh, and the victims. They might know each other. They might be from the same communities. And indeed, those kind of overlaps very often uh, help the trafficker um, persuade the, 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 the victim into the situation of uh, exploitation. Um, if I can mention just three other traits that are quite interesting about traffickers, including in forced labor, is that compared to other crimes, we have more women. Um, and the reason for that are, are, are numerous, including the very broad definition of what actually human trafficking and therefore what who a human trafficker is. But in some countries, such as Malta, I believe the racial at the moment are about 50%. So that's quite an interesting phenomenon. I think that's also worth um, looking into. Um, and just again to highlight what I just said previously, that the, the, the definition of human trafficking is so broad and it captures a whole array of traffickers. Um, and so we, 
I think that requires some further research as well, particularly when it when it comes to um, forced labor. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, I think it was very important what you mentioned regarding the fact that we cannot develop action plans in a vacuum without sort of ensuring that it's coordinated with other initiatives in society in order to assist vulnerable groups. Very important to highlight that and also the fact that a person who ends up in trafficking might have had a very sort of a, a difficult history and had history of other forms of exploitation and the fact that this should be picked up earlier in by society. And also thank you so much for this with the links that we often see links between the traffickers and the victim. And the fact that also when it comes to labor exploitation, we have also women involved in, in recruiting to a larger extent than other forms, perhaps. Thank you very much. Uh, before I actually uh, move on, I was planning to, uh, I'm going to move on to Anina shortly, but I just want to also remember, uh, remind all the participants that you can ask questions. We will have a questions and answer session for the last 10 minutes of this session. So you can, by sort of clicking on the Q&A button uh, next to each panel, you can send us questions that I can then ask to the panelists. Thank you. And now moving on to you, Anina. Uh, you've done a research a mapping exercise in four countries where you argue that labor exploitation is a form of corporate crime motivated by economic profit. Companies engaging in labor exploitation and trafficking gain an unfair economic advantage and also distort competition and the uh, functioning of the free market. This leads, to sort of back, uh, leads us back to the headline of this panel. How do we, is it actually so that we do facilitate labor exploitation without knowing it? And what is the role of businesses in it? Anina, please. Um, thanks so much. And thank you, Anna, for the great question. And thank you to the former colleagues at TFTHB for in inviting me to talk about one of my favorite topics in, in the world. So um, as Anna, you mentioned, um, we, we did the analysis of, of cases that we collected in, in Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Bulgaria as, as part of our uh, recently finished uh, European Commission funded flow project and find that the main motivation of traffickers and, and perpetrators of labor exploitation is indeed money. And it's also clear that unscrupulous businesses want to they basically want to maximize their profits by any means. But, but we also, when we analyzed these cases, found that the borderline between legal, gray and illegal forms of business activities, um, it's not always very evident. And in fact, many countries have problems in differentiating between less severe forms of labor exploitation more serious forms and then ultimately trafficking for forced labor. So exploiting one's workers is very economically profitable for businesses, uh, but the risk of getting caught and sanctioned are, are low. Um, I also think that it's interesting and, and uh, alarming that the response of the criminal justice system to labor exploitation is often insufficient and actually uh, based on our research, authorities have problems constructing these kind of uh, incidents as crimes. And sometimes they're rather seen as simple wage disputes or uh, as uh, minor violations of, of the labor code. So um, in short, the, the current system indeed enables labor exploitation. Uh, due to these existing practices and, and lack of oversight and accountability. Um, I would also like to point out that the, the businesses that are benefiting from labor exploitation, they are not restricted to just criminal organizations or networks by any means. And indeed, often a chain of legitimate businesses can also be um, engaged in labor exploitation both knowingly, but also often unknowingly. Mm -hmm. And um, we've, uh, in, in our analysis, we identified a number of schemes and, and legitimate business structures, which are used to avoid detection by authorities. 
Um, and, and these include schemes like the use of um, uh, cascade subcontracting, the use of letterbox companies and fronts, posting of workers through different arrangements, and as well as bogus self-employment. Um, and companies which use these kind of schemes may insert themselves in, in the long subcontracting chains and, and implement their activities in the lower parts of the chain. So in, in this regard, I would really like to emphasize the need of the company oversight and, and that companies themselves can do a lot to make sure that their supply chain is is clean and that they have a close relationship with their vetted subcontractors and that the workers also among these subcontracting companies in their supply chain have information on their rights and, and ways they can report problems anonymously, for example, using ethical channels. So I, I indeed, from the perspective of the um, uh, prevention, it, it is uh, important to interrupt also in these less severe forms of labor exploitation and economic crimes rather than just focus on very evident cases of trafficking for forced labor or like very serious violations. And, and in the end, I just wanted to emphasize the role of governments, authorities and, and businesses all. Um, they have a role in order to make sure that we don't facilitate labor exploitation in our societies. And as a part of the flow project that I mentioned earlier, we also developed a toolkit for businesses with five concrete tools for them themselves to take action against labor trafficking and exploitation in their local supply chains. And then we also developed an investigation tool for law enforcement and checklist for labor inspectors to use. So I think all of these tools um, are very important and, and these measures that are developed to make sure that we don't in fact facilitate labor exploitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anina, for a very solid answer. And I think very much also you started with the fact that this is all about money. Trafficking in human beings wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the profit of the traffickers. So this is very important that we actually try to follow the flow of money within the sort of chain of exploitation. And the fact that you also pointed out that there are sort of different levels of exploitation and it can be difficult to uh, identify the actual crime. But we have to see the exploitation throughout the whole chain. And also the importance of sort of trying to see these schemes that are hidden in some subcontracting, etc. And also, of course, that we need to have reporting structure, reporting um, uh, sort of clear lines for reporting in order for victims to have someone to report to. And, they are being exploited. So very positive also that you have developed these different forms of toolkits in order for businesses and private sectors to use, because I do think it can be difficult to know what to actually do to prevent this form of exploitation and also how to identify it in the first place. But then when it comes to victims, you're sort of a second question. Could you just please highlight uh, from a victim's perspective, what the shady business model looks like uh, and what do we actually need in order to better sort of protect victims of trafficking for labour exploitation? Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. I think uh, it is always very important to, to protect the rights of the wo workers and the victims and we should put the, prioritise those rights. So. Um, in our flow project report Shady Business, we, we analyze this business model of labor trafficking, which relies on two strategies, cost reduction and, and revenue generation. So while the cost reduction strategy um, implemented by the businesses um, relies on reduction of labor costs through underpayment or uh, not providing legally required conditions for safe and healthy work environment and evasion of taxes and social and health contributions. Um, this, uh, the other strategy, this revenue generation strategy, um, it relies on um, 
um, imposition of uh, upfront fees from the victims for securing a job in, in the first place, as, as well as then inflation of cost for a different kind of cost like transportation, housing, food, clothes, even like necessary work equipment and tools. So uh, we have identified cases where victims may have paid up to 15 or 20,000 euros for the first job in, in the first place. And then they may have to pay large daily or weekly fees, for example, accommodation or tools. So, um, um, but, but in a major problem is that in, in many uh, cases, uh, victims of, of labor exploitation are very hesitant to come forward and disclose their experiences to authorities because they, they of course, uh, fear losing their jobs and, um, and uh, as a result also their work permits and, 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 and therefore it is difficult for them to disclose their experiences. But also they lack information on themselves. Sometimes they don't even know who they work for or that they are self-employed. They are simply signs on papers and, and do not know that they have been scientists and entrepreneurs in, in the first place. But they don't know about the minimum wage regulations or wage regulations according to the collective agreement in their sector of work. And, and these, of course, vary in different countries, so it is very complicated for the victims to know about what is right. And, and, and the perpetrators know that if somebody complains, they can simply recruit a new person to take their place. But what I would like to emphasize is that it's uh, very important to remember that um, victims of human trafficking have right to specialized assistance, uh, while victims of um, mere labor exploitation do not have. So therefore, it is extremely important that cases that have indicators of human trafficking are actually investigated under this offense label. But, but we also need to offer assistance to other victims of, of labor exploitation, not just victims of, of trafficking. And, and for many workers, the key uh, for them, it is essential for them to get access to remedy and, and ways in which they can claim their unpaid wages. So I think we really need to find more flexible ways for victims to claim their wages rather than engage in a very long and potentially very expensive civil process, for example. And we also need to make sure that authorities confiscate perpetrators' assets and proceeds of crime and that the perpetrators, rather than these exploited workers, get sanctioned for their actions. And I would also need would like to emphasize the need to establish a firewall so that also undocumented workers can, can come forward and, and, and disclose their experiences to um, authorities. So in the end, we should always prioritize victims and workers' rights um, in order to make sure that they are protected and, and that they have ways in which to access justice easily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anina, for po pointing out the, the evident that we need, not the evident, but the, the importance of the fact that we need to ensure the rights of workers and the rights of victims, but also the fact how difficult it is in, to identify the victims and also reach out to victims and workers in order for them to understand what rights they actually do have. And also the fact that exploitation can so easily be hidden in schemes where you actually are paying back fees under the table to your employer lawyer, etc. Et so uh, we have, it's extremely challenges and I thought it was very interesting that you, this firewall uh, for workers in order for them to being able to report was a very interesting suggestion. Thank you so much. Uh, I would now like to move over to Magnus. Magnus uh, at the Working Environment Authority. Many sectors are 
Now, the Swedish Working Environment Authority does not have a specific mandate as such to target trafficking in human beings. Uh, but in order to look at uh, and prevent rule breaking in the con uh, context of work environment, this is also important as it is urgent to disturb companies not following these rules. But what uh, preventive measures and actions would you like to see more of in order to avoid exploitation of workers uh, at the Swedish labour market? Please. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, it, I did not have the possibility of attending the conference in the morning. I had other meetings, uh, unfortunately, because I came into the last half hour on the former panel and it seemed really, really interesting, but I will look at it afterwards. Thank you so much to Julia and Anina also for pointing out so very specific things that we need to do. I like the I like the logistic approach, uh, the holistic, the logistic, of course, but the holistic approach. And I also like the the um, uh, the lack of oversight, or at least I, like you have identified it, Anina, that is a little bit of what I'm going to talk about also. So to start off, uh, I mean, the question that you pose uh, regarding if it um, facilitates uh, facilitates um, the recruitment for labor exploitation due to how things work in Sweden, I can say it in one word, yes, it does. Um, and we know it. Um, and the reasons for this are several, and we will not cover, I will not cover all of them, but the direct, or I will not cover the direct implications that comes out of this, but I will talk about some of the things that we as an authority dealing with occupational health and, sa health and safety see as crucial, both to the shortcomings and the possibilities to more effectively combat forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation. Uh, but first I need to give you some setting to this um, and insights into what we have done uh, and now what, what we're doing right now and what we look forward to do in the future. One important aspect is that we do not deal with uh, salaries or labor law in general. We deal with OSH issues, like I said. It is the social partners via collective agreements that sets the levels of salaries. Uh, we don't have any minimum wage, and it's quite interesting to see that we have the highest levels of, um, of income salaries uh, in Europe if, in comparison anyway. So that's also a factor to put in there. So this is the sort of bottom line setting for us. Uh, but we have, however, during the last couple of years, been more and more drawn into parts of the labor market where we usually have not been active. We haven't had any assignments or mandates in the areas, uh, like regarding undeclared work and work-life criminality. Uh, but just recently, our minister uh, was pointing out the importance uh, of uh, goals for us regarding combating work-life criminality and labor exploitation, and also pointing out, which is, which I'm very happy for since I'm heading the international unit, that the uh, international cooperation is really important. And like um, and you said, Anna, I've been very active in different European forums, amongst others, like you mentioned, the ELA, but uh, also the Platform for Undeclared Work. I've been very active there since 2016. And we have seen how we've been moving further and further along the line towards the shady areas of the labor market and the work-life criminality aspects as an authority, and that we have had to deal with it. So we had, in fact, between 2015 and 18, an internal program looking at this uh, with about seven other authorities, uh, like the police and tax, uh, and we do joint inspections together nowadays also, uh, according to this. So we have done and are doing quite a lot actually on the fringes of direct labor exploitation and the criminal parts of the European labor market, which we, of course, in Sweden are very much a part of. And um, we see the challenges uh, and the possibilities. Uh, there's a lot of things and mixes in all of this. Uh, I would also like to uh, advertise the fact that, uh, so you, that you all know that we have been from Sweden chairing uh, two projects financed by the commission looking into the undeclared work part of the European labor market together with the other Nordic countries and the Baltic states. Two of the Baltic states has participated in this. And please contact me if you would like to have some more information on the results of those projects. They're quite interesting, quite large. So there's a lot of things to, to gather from those. Uh, and oh yes, we have also last year together with the Swedish Gender Equality Agency done training in labor exploitation for our inspectors throughout the regions. How to detect and how to report it, it sounds simple enough, but it can be stressed enough, or can't be stressed enough, I would rather say, that shared knowledge and collaborations is important if we are to be able to combat these things. It's very much like uh, Anina said earlier, it's about the cooperation. 
So the authority has done this work and has been assigned those things from our government because of how we view the chain of effects. If it is trafficking, a third country national, a EU citizen being posted to Sweden or a Swedish worker for that instance, not unionized. If this individual ends up in criminal and shady companies, it is them that in the end suffers. It's the individual worker that suffers and are exposed to different kinds of dangers and abuse. So the Swedish work environment has a special mandate to go to work sites and places on plan or unplanned inspections. Uh, but the police and tax also has that. But we have seen that the effectiveness and results are much better if we go together. And that is some of the results we've seen the, the last couple of years. So that's why we also get the new assignments and the focus on us as an authority. Uh, but back to the questions as, at hand, Anna. Uh, why do we risk the facilitation then of forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation? And what measures I think are needed? And I am going to list things, and I, I like to list things because it makes my it, it makes clear in my own mind and hopefully in yours also. So the risk of facilitation. In fact, the collaboration between authorities in the joint authority control, it's a government assignment between other the other authorities, has one big problem, and that most information cannot be shared due to secrecy laws. We fight with this every day. We we sit together, we plan inspections together, but we can't share information. Resources and priorities within the authorities differ. We don't have the direct same assignments from the, our respective ministries. The collaboration between authorities and the social partners is merely on the side of sharing information rather than working together directly. Uh, and also that we do not cover labor law salaries. I Anina mean, already pointed that out, uh, that we have a huge black hole in the middle of our labor market where nobody really has the responsibility to cover those things. Uh, and that is especially then for foreign workers that are not connected to a union, for instance. And also, we don't have any mandate to demand for, like Anina also pointed out, proper housing and facilities, which is one of the most common things we see. Exploited people with poor living conditions, small rooms with many people in them, and thus are exposed to even more things like sickness. And with the pandemic today, it's especially uh, alarmingly, I would say. And then moving over, lastly, then to the measures that are needed. It has already been pointed out, I think it was Julia who mentioned that, get the issues high up on the political agenda. This conference today is part of that, of course, and suggest changes in law, work together with decision makers on solutions and priorities. And we should do this as jointly together with several other authorities where we have identified uh, common priorities. See to that there is a, some responsibility, at least somewhere to cover for the foreign workers regarding salaries and work agreements. I already mentioned that. Uh, more of the direct assignments uh, accompanied with adequate resources. Resources is on the governmental side always uh, a big issue. Uh, work more closely with the social partners. And this is really important to do this uh, regionally and locally. We can talk as much as we want on a more higher level, but we need to go down on the ground out in the regions with our inspectors and other, uh, other uh, social partners, unions on, on the local, uh, on the ground, so to speak. More cross-border work, work, of course, building on experiences done, put into structured collaborations between different authorities, di many different uh, competencies, competences also, making us more agile. I think that is what I would like really to see, that uh, we as authorities, we are not so swift. They move fast on the labor market and they are very quick of finding new ways of, of uh, doing what they want to do. And so we need to be more up to speed on competence in such an analysis together with others being possible to make shifts in priorities quite quickly. That is one thing that is quite hard in, in within a Swedish uh, government, a Swedish authority, I would say. Maybe in the government also, but I don't know. Uh, safeguard the workers uh, and at the same time be able to get information that could help out in investigating. So if we find workers on a work site, we don't send them out of the country directly. We could have a structured way of interviewing them in a safe way. Uh, as I've seen when I've been with Anina, for example, in, in other countries. And then lastly, Anna, please bear with me. I would just like to point out that collaborations between authorities nationally and cross-border with strengthened mandates, assignments and resources is the most important. We are moving in the right direction, but there is, as I have said, quite a lot of things still to tackle and get along with. So uh, thank you so much for that, Anna. 
Thank you so much, Magnus, for listing all the challenges, but also the fact that you're pointing out solutions to the challenges. And I think uh, to sort of summarize the fact that we're actually, like you're saying, we're heading in the right direction, but we still have a lot more to do, more work to be done in order to make sure that uh, enough resources are invested, that the actors have the, the right mandates, and also that it's, of course, the, a good environment for cooperation between actors. I think you mentioned, for example, the Swedish secrecy law, etc. And also the fact that we need constant sort of uh, capacity building in this field. We've, sometimes you do feel that we have done trainings and trainings for actors, but we need to do more trainings. And I think that was very clearly pointed out from your side. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I do have a, uh, one more question due to the fact that I know that you have looked in quite a lot to uh, the Nordic, Nordic countries when it comes to the so-called gig economy and potential exploitation of workers when it comes to, for example, cheap taxi services, delivery companies of food, etc. Uh, you have taken a proactive approach there by looking into the gig economy. What have you seen in terms of exploitation risks within the uh, uh, gig economy? Just a brief answer to that would be very much appreciated. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, we are working with this question in very in a very direct manner since we have a government assignment that aims at looking into these digital nomads situation and how we as an authority can act. To put it plainly, does our regulations have any possibility and forms any demands on the companies that they work for? Uh, and a bit of a spoiler alert, it is very much about the status of employment. Who is the employer at all? Uh, and this is a tricky thing that we have tried out in court and we have even lost in court. But we have also had some positive outcomes from the work. We've done quite a lot of inspections on platform economies, uh, platform companies, uh, gig workers are recovering and uh, it's a moving target. But we, uh, we have also got positive results in that the companies that we had in dialogue with, they have adjusted themselves when they have realized uh, what they are sort of doing to the workers. So we have had some positive effects in that sense that two companies themselves employed the um, the ones who were working for them. And I just want to mention that within that undeclared work project with the Nordic Baltic projects uh, where we had, uh, we had a gig uh, webinar with, uh, with all the labor inspectors looking into the challenges and the risks for the gig uh, workers. Uh, and we found out and we had some really prominent researchers that, that there's a lot of a uh, lower average uh, age, lower training levels, a rapid pace of work, risks for injury, and especially in sectors like the delivery, et cetera, with accidents, road accidents, and so on, as we've seen in many countries. And But also the psychological fact about the continuous real-time evaluation and performance rating induces stress, and the work takes place in private settings, which leads to lack of awareness, and which also means that we as an authority don't, we don't cover them, we don't see them. We can't really see where they are and what they're really uh, affected by. And I just lastly wanted to say, I can see the time is running, but other aspects that have been reported in studies regarding the gig workers and that which we are really taking into account as an authority now is uh, they do not get paid in case of missing a day's work because of illness, family affairs, or personal reasons. Uh, they feel afraid to demand a better employment and working conditions because they feel under pressure. They are sort of, uh, uh, feeling pressured that if they say something, uh, they would a negative thing, then they would lose lose uh, working hours. Uh, well, they can't take vacations and all all of that. We all know about these risks and, and things. And uh, as a conclusion, I would just say that to say that um, this is due, as we have seen it, because of online consumption that has increased. The home delivery has increased. Uh, the uh, the uh, they don't, they don't get, they do a lot of heavy work and they don't get the personal protective equipment or sick pay or hazard pay for performing different certain tasks. So I, all in all, I think it's a situation that no one else would like to live in and work within, I believe. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very heavily affected by the pandemic also, as we've seen it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Magnus. I think it's also what you're saying here when you're talking about the fact that the people in the gig economy are sort of very uh, at risk of exploitation in the sense that they also have uh, challenges in reporting the fact that they will lose payment, etc. and that they're being highly monitored. 
And it's clear also the fact that we have a demand side here. We cannot forget the fact that uh, trafficking human beings is a demand-driven crime and that we all have a responsibility here. So as consumers, when it comes to the exploitation that our consumption actually leads to is something that we sort of all should think about more. Thank you very much, Magnus. Now moving on more to sort of the assistance and support to migrants, Philip, uh, I was going to ask you the fact that your organization, Arbeintut Leben, you provide support to migrants in the German labor market. Can you tell us shortly about what you concretely do and also maybe reflect on some of the measures that you've done that have had a positive impact in the context of labor exploitation? Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. And um, thank you for the invitation to this conference. I'm really happy to be here and to listen to you all. Um, yeah, actually, I was I was going to uh, reflect a little bit on the role of, um, of um, recruitment in our work. And uh, unfortunately, I have to say that uh, the, the, the role we, actually we don't see a role of uh, recruitment in our work. There is no no nothing we can do, which is very uh, disappointing for us. Um, and maybe this is the short answer. And maybe I can extend a little bit on it because I think the the answer illustrates the problem around uh, recruitment and also points towards uh, possible solutions. Uh, maybe just just another brief sentence about what we do. Uh, as you said, Anna, we run counseling services for migrant workers, focusing on the enforcement of, of labor rights. Uh, so our, our daily business is what, what Anina mentioned, is to, to claim back wages, to, um, to react to, to illegal uh, uh, measures of, of uh, employers. We do that in 12 different languages and uh, support around or even more than 5,000 people a year. And we also run a specialized uh, service to support uh, victims of forced labor. And on a structural level, we run the, uh, the National Service Center against forced labor on behalf of the Ministry of, of Labor and Social Affairs, where we support all involved actors uh, to get involved, to know what is going on, and to to be able to to cooperate. The, the, the fact that uh, yeah, what, what Magnus also mentioned and and all, uh, previous speakers that the the collaboration between different agencies, between different organisations, is 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 crucial. Um, what we see in the counselling work is that the vast majority of workers find their jobs through a recruiter, um, which points to the fact that recruitment is an, an important part of international labor migration, uh, which means also that uh, recruitment should not be banned or, or uh, uh, restricted, but rather better regulated and, and also monitored. Um, this is hard for us to acknowledge as we see that uh, recruiters um, have a part to play in, in working uh, in, in poor working conditions and what damages they do to, to migrant workers. Just to give you two examples of, of many we see in our in our counseling work, uh, maybe one one example which I would call a simple method that's, uh, that uh, regards a group of Ukrainian workers who were promised uh, jobs in Germany by a recruiter they had to pay the recruiter and were sent by the recruiter to a, a bus station in Germany. And there the recruiter left them uh, without without job, without money, and make them dependent, made them dependent on the on the uh, worst offers on the on the labor market. And but lately we also observe a pretty sophisticated let's call them services for, for workers, especially within the EU. Uh, in these cases, um, um, there's, there's one case of a, of a worker who uh, comes into contact with a, with a German company to be exp uh, employed as a, as a truck driver. And then the company refers this man to a, a recruiter, which organizes 
the employment by a Portuguese company. And as an employee of the Portuguese company, he's then working for the German company. So the only purpose of this recruitment is to worsen uh, the, labor, the, the labor conditions, the working conditions. Um, the problem for us now, for, for, the, for the counseling service, is that we cannot derive any claims uh, that we could enforce for the workers due to fair, uh, unfair or poor uh, recruitment. As to, as to labor law, as to, as to uh, labor rights, we have the labor law as a basis, but for unfair recruitment, we don't have a, we don't have a basis. And the question there for me is, would it be possible to set up specific claims that can be enforced by the uh, individual workers? The second reason why uh, recruitment does not play a role in our counseling work is because it is often not clear who is responsible for what. We see a gray area of responsibility between the recruiter and the uh, employer. Um, just to give you um, an example, we just had a case which, uh, which was really uh, covered, uh, intensively covered by the by German media of uh, Pol Polish parcel delivery drivers who worked for a subcontract of a big German parcel service and were not paid, they had no food, they had to sleep in the forest. And they were recruited by a big and well-known Polish recruitment company who also handed uh, work contracts. So apparently everything went well uh, as, to, as to the recruitment. Um, but, but still, the, the question is, uh, does, does this recruiter has a uh, um, responsibility as to the, as to the company he's, he's recruiting for? On the other hand, we see that the recruiters are often the, the, the main contact for the workers when something goes wrong. They don't contact the employer, they contact the, the recruiters. Uh, and the many recruiters also act like employers. And many workers therefore think that the recruiters are the real employers. We also observe, for example, that uh, German meat companies, they set up uh, temporary work, work agencies in Poland, which now after, after the, 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 the subcontracting in the meat industry was banned by, by law, the, the companies, they turn into recruitment companies using even the same name. So therefore, the question for us is, how exactly can we de de define the responsibility of the recruiter? Uh, and my first and last reason why recruitment does not play a role for us is that we do not yet have a structure to which we can report abuse. We often see companies in, acting in, uh, residing even in, in Germany and uh, recruiting in countries of origin via the internet with obviously illegal conditions. And we we help. We, we are able to, to help the, 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 the workers, but the, the company continues uh, to, to recruit, uh, even if we take action against against them. And there, the, the, the question uh, is again on a transnational cooperation: how we can cooperate, how we can have a structure to report um, illegal or, or unfair recruitment. Okay, I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip, for pointing out, both for telling us about your important work that you do within your organization, but also the fact that we need to look more at the recruitment phase when it comes to trafficking for labor exploitation and the fact that it's now very much so that it's unregulated and it's not properly monitored and we actually don't know how to target sort of unfair recruitment and when recruitment companies themselves actually are the traffickers or involved in the trafficking chain. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we now have sort of moved over to the question and answers session. We have 10 more minutes to go and I would like to ask, maybe start by actually going back to Julia uh, when it comes to uh, male victims. 
How do you sort of, we often hear that first of all, it's difficult to assist male, male victims due to the fact that there might not be service uh, facilities that are adapted to male needs, but also the fact that uh, male victims do not want to be identified and assistant, uh, assisted via counseling, etc., but rather maybe just want reimbursement and then go back home again without reporting the fact that they have actually been exploited. So how, how would you perceive that? Could you sort of elaborate a bit on that? Thank you. Yes, so um, I was very fortunate and I, I worked for about five years or so in a shelter that was specifically for male victims. Um, and they were predominantly from Eastern Europe, predominantly from Poland, uh, although that those trends actually it changed. Um, you know, their needs were the, the ones that we all know about. Um, the, well, their, their main first priority was actually to, you know, get a new job, get, be able to earn some money. Uh, many of them did not want to come home, uh, despite being even offered money to go home. I think the UK government at the time had a program of, you know, take a thousand pounds and, and go home sort of thing. Um, so their, their main priority was around, um, uh, was around work and, and, and having a kind of digni dignified life. Um, we, we did also offer them a psychological counseling. And as you rightly pointed out or hinted at, that was quite a challenge, um, getting them to, to, to think that it might be something useful, you know, the kind of usual stereotypes existed of, no, I don't need that, I can, you know, get on with my own, about my own uh, issues. Uh, but we found that once they did start talking to the counsellors, uh, they actually really, really liked it and, and definitely went back for more and would even recommend it to, to some of their colleagues. Um, so, that, so that was quite a positive uh, uh, thing. The other, the biggest challenge was actually around substance abuse. I'd say most of them, again, Again, up 80%, something like that, had uh, alcohol problems. Some also had drugs. And it was very difficult for the shelter on, on, on what to do uh, that because sometimes, because you know, you obviously, they wanted to help them, but actually very often um, because of the various substance abuse, the, 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 the lives or health of the uh, of the support workers such as myself were actually put put at put at risk and so the the, ha the shelter had a no 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 alcohol p policy and kind of like a you know two strikes and you're out um which you can understand but on one hand you also understand that you know these were pre these were probably people with substance abuse problems uh, and having a two strikes and you're out policy probably did more harm they again ended up on the street um, so that was a really big challenge particularly what to do around that around that substance uh, abuse thank you very much julia and i think this is also comes back to the fact what you talked about in the beginning about the perfect victim and also the fact that there is a chain of exploitation that might not be the actual uh, trafficking but the person has been exploited or being in a vulnerable situation for a long time which also can make it difficult to assist uh, and help a person out of the current situation thank you very much uh, i do now have a question for anina uh, in your view, are companies included enough in the work against labor exploitation or is it, is it a question of them not being interested or what could sort of pr persuade private companies to actually engage in order to eliminate exploitation of workers? Yeah, um, that, that's a really good question. I think that the companies, we've had some very good cooperation with companies in, in Finland and also as part of this GLOW project, we cooperated with companies in Estonia and Latvia and Bulgaria. And I do think that there's more interest by the governments to, to do more and to include um, actions against labor exploitation into their uh, corporate social responsibility schemes. Um, and and I, I think it's also important to, to, to work together with um, employers associations and, and they also, at least in the Finnish context, are uh, more and more interested in, in this topic and have some um, examples where they've also um, concretely uh, employed victims of, of trafficking. So that's one aspect that the, of the work that they can do. But uh, I think we still then have a lot of those companies that don't realize that this is a problem or don't realize that this is a problem when they're procuring services like within their own countries. So maybe they know about issues that relate to forced labor or child labor in, um, 
in Asia or in Africa, but they don't realize that this might be an issue when they're procuring cleaning services, for example. So I think um, one of the like the main aims of the tools that we've um, developed is for them to like concretely find ways in which this relates to their own work and that they have a strategy, that it, it is in their strategy, their employees know about this, they um, vet their partners and have good cooperation about this uh, and that they have also uh, clauses in, in their contract should something like this come out that they know and have processed on what they can do and that they can also do oversight in, in their own supply chains and talk to the workers, do checkups and have these ethical channels. So there's a lot that the companies can do if they are properly motivated. And for that, we need also legislation and, and regulation. But that's it shortly. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think it's very important, like you said, in the sense that we have to help companies to see the unseen. And very good that you're pointing out that your toolkit is actually doing exactly that to erase, raise the awareness, but also uh, provide tools for companies to be able to act on, on exploitation and prevent exploitation. Uh, I do have a quick question for Magnus. Uh, you talked a lot about international cooperation. What would you sort of say that you value the most in terms of international cooperation? What have you seen so far that has been sort of ex uh, exceptionally beneficial for this area? Well, it, it is what you yourself mentioned, Anna, the capacity building. I always go back to the learning issue of uh, the fact that we are doing this together. We should be doing all of this together. We are encountering the same problems, the same challenges, and we are trying to find uh, solutions. Uh, and we should not try to find solutions on ourselves. We should sort of share all the good examples and share all the detailed information. For example, like it's, I've heard it before, but it's always interesting to listen from Arvait und Leben and Philip today about the, the concrete uh, individuals uh, uh, experiences and that can help us out in finding solutions together on, on and also to sort of clarify and see what we within our mandate can do and what we would like is in that sense otherwise our mandate to be expanded with uh, to be able to help out in other other areas than we have now so that's in, in short words Thank you very much. And Philip, then lastly, just a quick question. From your practical perspective, we talked about recruitment. What would you su suggest in order to secure transparent and, and fair recruitment of workers? Just sort of a quick word on that would be very much appreciated. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a long wish list, of course, but I just highlight two two aspects. Maybe the the, the first one is international cooperation, same as as uh, Magnus. And actually, my colleagues have been very happy to to collaborate with you within the Euro Detachment uh, project. Um, and and we are in, in in terms of recruitment. Uh, it would be interesting to explore which structures, which, which existing structures could be used, like the IMI, the, the International Market Information System, which is which is also used for, for the posting of workers. So the, the, the question would be, could this or a similar structure also could uh, be, be used for for communicating on on uh, unfair uh, recruitment? And of course, for us, it's, it's uh, very important that we as an NGO could also also take part the second maybe brief thing is that uh, I think it would be really important to um, uh, get the, the recruitment agency uh, world more transparent. And this is actually why we're in contact with the ITC, the International Trade Union Configuration, Intra Configuration which, is, which has set up an online tool which is called the Migrant Recruitment Advisor, which allows uh, migrant workers to rate the recruitment agency, and we're uh, currently commonly, uh, jointly uh, trying to explore ways to bring the recruitment advisor also to Europe.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the time has come to an end. I would like to thank all the pan panelists for your interesting interventions, uh, pointing out the challenges that we have in terms of that we need more capacity building, mandates, clear mandates, etc., et and ensure rights of workers or victims, and that we also need to make sure that they can be properly identified. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you now a nice lunch, and you will be back for the session in one hour. Welcome back to the conference and to the final panel of today, which is dedicated to increasing individual and um, community resilience to forced labor and um, trafficking for labor exploitation. I am pleased to introduce our three panelists joining us today. Uh, we have with us Dr. Annette Brunowski. Annette is sociologist and researcher at FAFO, an independent research institute in Oslo. Annette has conducted numerous studies on human trafficking with special focus on provision of assistance to victims. Thank you, Annette, for joining us today. Uh, we have also Zita Kabais with us. Zita is a former victim and survivor of human trafficking for labor exploitation and domestic worker from the Philippines. She is the member of the ODR International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Board, and she is also a founder and president of Filipino Association in Paris. Zita, we are very happy to have you um, here today with us. And our third panelist is Veiko Makela a project manager in the Finnish National Assistance System for Victims of Human Trafficking. Veiko has extensive direct experience with victims of human trafficking. Thank you for joining us, Veiko. Even thought we were exploited here, after all the help we received and the good people we met, we are still left with good memories about this country and we hope to come back for proper work. The group of men, uh, labor mice, said when they were leaving uh, Finland after they received assistance. When we identify a victim of human trafficking, we unfortunately cannot turn the clock back. But uh, we cannot change their past. But what we can do is we can try to change their future. We can help victims to build their resilience to forced labor and human trafficking and provide necessary assistance and, to, and support to help them to rebuild their lives. It seems straightforward, um, but we all know that um, assistance is not always provided. If it's provided, it's not always adequate. In, um, often it's short term. It's linked very much to the legal status of a uh, victim and it might not take into the full consideration specific needs and circumstances of the victim. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to dive straight into the questions uh, to our panelists. Um, Annette, I would like to ask um, my first question um, to you. The number of identified and um, assisted victims of trafficking is increasing um, in Europe, but still labor trafficking cases are hugely underreported. In your latest report on trafficking for labor exploitation, you look at uh, when and how victims of labor trafficking um, seek um, help and uh, what challenges coordination of assistance presents. Could you please guide us through uh, your main um, findings? Thank you. And, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all. I'm, I've been following this conference today with great interest and, uh, and um, there is so much competence and experience on these different panels. And um, so, yeah, I was thinking about sort of what might be 
an overarching perspective in a way for those those questions you just asked me. Uh, they are very complex issues. Sort of what what makes people seek help and what are the challenges in coordination of, of help. And, and I think that an overarching perspective would be that we need to take the viewpoint of the other. We need to take a fundamentally empathetic approach. And when I say that, I, I don't mean something to be confused with uh, something sort of anything akin to pity or or something that is sort of soft and touchy feely but it's about understand uh, understanding the viewpoint what the world looks like for for uh, people who have been trafficked uh, what makes sense in their situation, uh, what doesn't make sense. And so it means really listening to trafficked persons and incorporating their experiences in, in policy development and service design. And I'm going to come back to sort of a bit more concretely these, these issues. Um, but I think that that actually the same issue of uh, of empathy and understanding the viewpoint of the other is also very relevant in when it comes to the issue of coordination of assistance and, and interagency um, cooperation, which is hugely important in this field. It's absolutely necessary and it's also quite difficult. Um, so I think we need to have this focus on can we can we understand the framework our collaborators work within? Um, can we understand what the issue might look like from from their viewpoint? There's a very big difference between being a social worker, for instance, and being the police. And and how can we how can we come together uh, to work effectively? Um, most people also work within institutions that have different overarching, other overarching goals, other job descriptions, other tasks they need to, to perform. And so uh, can we understand that while our roles are different and sometimes conflicting, we are still working towards the same goal? And I think one of the key issues here is to, to find... Uh, ways to work together to get to know and meet each other, which hopefully we will be able to do much more in person uh, in the time to to come than we have been able to in the um, past year for obvious reason. Uh, but I think that this this whole element of meeting each other, seeing each other, talking to each other is is key to developing trust and and to to fostering an understanding between different actors. And so, as you mentioned, this uh, this new report uh, that we have issues, my colleague um, Annemette Ödegård at Fafo and I, we have written about these issue, uh, issues in more detail. And we've looked into the Norwegian landscape, uh, institutional landscape, in this report on, on labor trafficking. And, um, and it was first published in 2019. And uh, so I'm very happy to say that as part of uh, part of the CAPE project, we are now actually today um, publishing this summary, updated summary report, uh, which can now be found on FAFO's website. I was I was just checking if it's there. So uh, if you're interested, it's it can be found on uh, fafo.no. Um, it's written in Norwegian. Uh, but it also includes a five-page executive summary in English. Uh, so this may be of relevance to some of you. Um, and uh, I think that focusing on this issue of um, when and how traffic persons seek help. Um, so it is most often from from my understanding and in my experience it's it's very often because the situation has become extremely difficult or um, it can be because someone else intervenes and present an opportunity or information they didn't previously know about so these are these are um, key points for for seeking seeking help um, but at the same time um, Ending up in a very difficult situation doesn't necessarily mean that people will seek help. And another issue that I would like to to underline here is also the 
the, the vast variety of needs and resources and wishes among trafficked persons and that we shouldn't fall into this trap of believing that everyone has the same needs or even similar needs always or the same priorities or the same decision-making process. So um, it's all too easy to sort of lump trafficking uh, trafficked persons together as as a uniform group and and from my uh, my years of um, research with with people who who have been categorized as trafficked persons i've found that to be anything from the case so we may be we may be talking about uh, migrant workers who have for instance education and specializations within for instance something to do with construction work um and who have no other options uh, but agreeing to exploitative deals uh, to facilitate uh, migration um, one example might be refugees who are not successful in, in asylum applications. Um, in that situation, their debts to in order to move on, crossing borders and so on, may accumulate very quickly and, and create a financial, financial pressure and a very vulnerable situation. Um, and to mention another example, uh, we may also be looking at extremely vulnerable groups, uh, for instance, people with with, um, well, for instance, lighter cognitive disabilities who are exploited in their social networks or even family networks uh, or people with substance dependencies and so on. So we're talking about, the, can, we can be looking at a, at a very varied group of people. And so I think that a useful way to approach this issue is perhaps not to ask so much when and how um, victims seek help because as i said in a way that's it's kind of almost a given it's it's often when they don't have any other alternatives or the situation has become extremely difficult but i think that we need to in order to think constructively about ways we can provide assistance and design um, design services is is to look at what is actually the help that is on offer uh, and the other question is what makes victims of exploitation not seek help. And so if we think first about this issue of what, um, what help is on offer, what does it represent for, for the person? Um, what are the possible gains for trafficked persons? What are the costs? Um, what is expected of them in return? And not least, this I find to be a recurring theme, what is, how predictable is the outcome of uh, this help in the longer term? So simply, is the help good enough? And I know that we have, we certainly have a long way to go on many of these um, variables. And I mean, it's clear most people do make a, a sort of a cost benefit analysis in their decision making um, generally for their lives. They try to assess what the outcomes will be of, of making this choice or the other. And in the case of seeking assistance as a trafficked person, the outcome can generally be extremely unclear and with little or no guarantees at the point where you need to make the, make the decisions. So again, this is returning to this overarching perspective again. We need to consider what, what is help and from whose perspective is it help. So if my, if my goal is to travel abroad and, and make money to provide for myself, for my family, uh, I end up exploited. So is it help for me to get um, a lawyer and for the people who exploited me to be uh, investigated for a long time and be prosecuted as a trafficker? Yes, maybe it is, but also maybe it isn't. Uh, maybe... Um, getting uh, getting another job with someone who, who treats me better is that perhaps the help that I'm I'm looking for? So there are these these needs can be very varied, um, and um, I think the whole issue of uh, employment and income as help is. Is central. I'm not saying that that's the only need because I think that we really need to consider the the health effects, of course, and uh, and uh, other effects of of trafficking and exploitation. But um, 
from my experience, this is, and it's unsurprising, this is what most people want. Um, and and that also, it's, it's not unique to labor exploitation victims, which I think is also important to underline. It's been a recurring theme with women I've interviewed over the years uh, who were trafficked for sexual exploitation. And uh, when they ask for help, they often ask for, for help to get a regular job. And for many of them, that has been the one thing that assistance providers haven't been able to help them with. Because, for instance, if they have irregular migrant status or there are other obstacles that stand in the way of regular employment. So... So that sort of brings me to another point that I think that sometimes we do, do not necessarily need to start completely from scratch when we look into these issues. I think there's a tendency sometimes to do that when we when we look at labor exploitation, certainly in Norway, sort of we're inventing the wheel over again. Um, we talk a lot about the limited number of verdicts, for instance, that uh, that means that there is limited jurisprudence helping us define important terms such as how to understand vulnerability or the exploitation of vulnerability, uh, which are, of course, also important to um to identification and and to some extent this is true but at the same time there are several verdicts on trafficking for sexual exploitation that include very important and very principled discussions on on vulnerability criteria that are completely transferable so so i think that um, my point here is that we we have well, we have perhaps like 20, 20 years of anti-trafficking experience and knowledge building that has absolutely ha had a focus on women trafficked for sexual exploitation. But I think there's sometimes a tendency um, for labor market actors to distance themselves a little bit from these fields, um, perhaps connected to the stigmatization of that field, um, perhaps because it's assumed that it's simply so different from everything else. But I'm I'm not actually sure that it always is. I think it's a lost opportunity sometimes to to learn from what is already there. Um, so, for instance, uh, I think that there's there's generally a lack of recognition of vulnerability factors uh, in the identification of labor trafficking. Um, there's been a tendency, I think, amongst the many actors to 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 think that people must be physically trapped or or that their passports must be taken away, uh, much like it used to be uh, er, in earlier days when we were uh, when we were first becoming aware of, of trafficking, exploitation in prostitution. So, so again, I think that we we need to incorporate perhaps more more of the lessons from that have already been made, but with different different actors. But um, yeah, and, and also I think that um, my own work, and this is obviously uh, something that leads me to think think this way, having having focused a lot on trafficking for prostitution and sexual exploitation, and now uh, in recent years more on labor trafficking. I think that there are many things that are transferable, and and so. This is the other issue that I suggest looking at um, in terms of um, in terms of traffic traffic persons and and seeking help. Looking at why why do people not seek help? Why do they decline assistance? What what are the factors that stand in the way? And uh, it's now I guess almost fifteen years ago that I I did a study with Rebecca Surtees on on that issue. Uh, in the bulk is, and I, I frankly think that many of those findings are still relevant today, and certainly also for labor labor trafficking. So, if we look at these reasons, they may fall into three categories: sort of the situation of the person, what help what help would represent in their lives, um, if uh, taking help means that it stands in the way of earning money, that's a huge reason not to not to seek help. And um, the second set of reasons are also related to this. It's uh, it's sort of it's to do with the organization of assistance, uh, information about assistance, and not being able to clearly outline what help would lead to. It's a major obstacle in uh, getting people to actually seek help. And and I'm thinking seriously. No wonder. Um, 
it's um, it's an issue with the way that help is organized in so many places today that it's so dependent on police investigations and uh, police interventions that the outcome is necessarily very unpredictable. And it depends on many things that are so far beyond the trafficked person's control. And I think that also this third set of, of uh, reasons not to seek help um, can be seen as having to do with the social context of, of the person. Issues of trust, issues of exclusion um, have been important and also identification or non-identification with with this sort of a general victim role. Um, I think that the trafficking victim role is it's it's tricky for a lot of people to um, to identify with. So I Let will it, sorry, close. If you could yeah. wrap wrap it up. You are in. My my next next sentence was that in closing up my remarks on this issue, um, I would just say that that it's. Uh, this empathetic approach and um, ensuring people's dignity uh, that it's protected and respected is really, I think that's the sort of the key principle that should be upheld. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, for really underlying that victims of human trafficking have different needs, different starting points, different resources, and we just cannot... Um, put them in the same um, the same group because they are not. And this is the question what I would like to ask Zita. Zita, from your perspective, what are the main um, needs victims of trafficking for labor exploitation um, have and our assistance systems, do they address these specific needs? Good afternoon, um, uh, and uh, first I, I want to thank you for inviting me to this conference. Um, for me, the, f the, the primary needs of the, uh, of the victims um, uh, is um, the administrative protection, shelter, health protection, and the basic needs. Although um, I want to uh, express my story, um, so that you will understand maybe um, the whole um, the whole needs of the victims and the survivors as well. So I am humbled and honored to be a part of this event that aims to educate and empower every participant here regardless from all walks of life, just like me, who simply started as a striving woman, who experienced different challenges in life, both good and bad, who would have known that I am here now sharing my painful experiences and real life battles with you and thinking that once in my life, I felt like I was invisible and voiceless. I was able to fight and now continuing similar fights, not just for myself, but also for others' battles and rights, hoping that they will also be heard and be seen. To start with, I would like to share a bit about my life. I was born in a family of nine children in a rural, rural village in northern part of the Philippines. Being the second eldest among my parents' siblings, my father was a farmer and my mother was a housekeeper. But most of the time, she also helped my father. I still remember I was about five to six years old. I started to understand the word difficult because by the time, while my parents are out and working at the farm, I needed to take care of my younger brothers and sisters, prepare food for all of us. 
When they left me in the morning, I had 20 liters of unpeeled rice to do manually to be ready when they arrived home. I had to work and needed to follow their instructions. When I was at the age of seven, my parents finally enrolled me at elementary school where I had to walk six kilometers every day from home. Despite of the long walk, I was so happy going to school and meet other children. And finally, I can play, I can play with them during recreation time. It's changed being doing household work in my early age. I have been so proud for my parents because I've been always on the top of my classmates. Sadly, after graduating primary education, my parents announced that they cannot afford to pay my studies, and I was so upset. Due to poverty, I was compelled to find employment to help the family survive, and I was at the age of 13 that I first worked as a domestic worker in the capital, in Manila, 300 kilometers from my village. Having grown through poverty, I, al I also dream of a better life like others had, but my dreams seem not easy to achieve. I work with rich people in Manila, a high official in the army, he had a big house in his own compound. I experienced to be lack inside their bungalow. I eat only leftovers. I didn't have a right to talk with the neighbors. Their main gate was only open when they came in and get out. Then I was beginning to worry about the situation. I said, if there's a fire, I will be burned inside. The, the lady who was working with me said, we will get out of here. So through her help, we managed to go together. She had a friend who works at the pharmacy and helped her to have a job. She was accepted because she got higher education than me. Then, for me, no work and no place to stay. I needed to beg with knees down to the owner of the pharmacy that I, can, I am willing to learn to give me training without salary, only in exchange of food and place where I can wash myself and take a rest. After a week, I finally accepted and worked permanently as a sales lady. Five years later, before my 19th birthday, I came back home to see my family. I didn't even recognize my brothers and sisters. I didn't even know my younger brother, who was born while I'm away. What I never know, my future husband followed me and arrived an hour after me. There, my parents were so angry against me, saying that this is biggest scandal in the village if I don't marry that guy. I was so surprised, but my father was so insistent. They organized the marriage and later became a mother to four children to offer them life different from what I was born into, give them an opportunity to finish their studies. I took on a bold decision and grabbed the chance to work abroad. When it was presented to me, young, naive, innocent, and full of hope, I was the perfect candidate 
for exploitation and abuse. Of course, I didn't know it at that time. It was only later that I deeply realized that I was a victim of so many things. The victim of the pernicious and irresponsible smugglers who put my life in danger during the journey that took me from Manila to Paris. Illegal travel organizers that made me cross the borders of Hungary to Italy by foot, crossing a river, water until my shoulder, and I didn't even know how to swim. Walking in the dark in the forest with those men who guide our way. I had nothing in my mind but my children asking myself, do I really need to leave them? But I needed to hold my breath. I needed to be strong because I believed all what happening there would be for good reasons. I was a victim of dishonest employers who have exploited me without a script. November 3, 1994, I finally, I finally arrived in Paris after one month struggling and met my recruiter. She said she was glad to see me in Paris. She brought me in her apartment and I stayed there a few days while looking a job for me. Luckily, she found a family who offered me a service room. Here, the family was nice, 11, but 11 months later, I met my second employer who exploited me. She offered higher salary, but what I never knew was that I had to work since 7 in the morning until very late night time, even weekends and non-working holidays. Here, my passport was confiscated too, and all of those, in my mind, was normal. Victim of the isolation, the barrier of the language and the ignorance of my rights. There, I had no rights to talk with strangers and had no time to learn the language, but in my mind, all of this was normal. And above all, a victim of my heavy family responsibility that I have endured. Like most migrant women, majority from the Philippines, who leave their families and countries to offer a future, a decent life to their children. In the midst of this painful experience, I had the chance to be freed from exploitation. I was assisted by the Committee Against Modern Slavery in France, the CCEM. I had the chance to discover my rights, although I was a foreigner. They helped me to know better all legal options, supported, supported me in preparing my case. Having testimonies helped me in starting a new life and one out of exploitation. On my own, I would not have the, the knowledge of all the procedures and the possibilities to have find a better life. All of this support helped to learn the language, learn more about domestic rights, this is also how I have started my career as a syndicalist with the CFDT later to defend the migrant domestic workers' rights. Then I was a part of the French Confederation of Democra Democratic Labor or CFDT, a union, a professional union in Paris region 
on domestic workers, where I began to militate and elected as general secretary in October 2003. I started to take my training through the help of the union, especially to learn the French language, how to manage the organization, how to organize domestic workers, which majority of them are strangers and women. The union was founded in 7th day of May 1965, which now covered by three national collective agreements to protect domestic workers. We carried out many legal actions to redress the wrongdoings done the, to the victims. I would like to share the story of one of the victims, an Indonesian young woman named Leila, who was employed by a foreign diplomat in France, exploited and abused. The union's lawyer defended her case. We won every stage of the proceedings, but Laila was unable to obtain the execution of these decisions. The orders sent to judicial officers, officers were opposed by the fact that Laila's former employer enjoyed the status of a diplomat and was in the capacity covered by the immunity provided for provided for by the Vienna Convention of 18 April 1961. It was necessary for the Union, and for me personally, to fight for more than a decade to obtain the condemnation of the French Foreign Ministry by the Conseil d'État or France Higher Court to pay the sum owed to the victim. This fabulous decision in favor of the victim was which for me also affects the economy because it is the money of the country and therefore of the taxpayers. It is a form of legal immunity that ensures diplomats are given safe passage and are considered not susceptible to lawsuit or prosecution under the host country laws, although they may still be, be expelled. It has always been an easy feat to conquer and achieve justice with these kinds of perpetrators, but I do not give up until I get the justice that victims deserve. Many cases more here, let me mention many names, few names to give them homage. Anabai, Jainab, Daina, Fatumata, and so other more. Based in my experience, oftentimes we only hear countless storytelling about this kind of maltreatment, abuse, or injustice but not paying attention on what we can do, how we can we help solving these underlying issues in the reality. I myself experienced slavery in the first hand. I encountered uncounted victims of labor trafficking who are forced to work. I use my own story my painful experience as an instrument to encourage these women to denounce, must not afraid because they are not alone, remembering my voice as also a survivor and fight the rights together is stronger. The implementation of the French law of 5 August 2013 which criminalizes modern slavery and traffic of human beings, protects victims from subjection of, to forced labor, from slavery to sexual abuse and dignity, abuse, sorry, and dignity, punishing those who committed these crimes. Had become instrumental 
in our fight against exploitation and abuse. I consider this is very important tool obtaining justice against the press. However, the question remains how many victims are still around the world who do not dare say or speak with the suffering, who feel threatened, therefore do not dare get out of their isolation. According to global estimates of modern slavery, forced labor and forced marriage, in 2016, 40.3 million people are in modern slavery, including 24.9 million in forced labor. It means there are 5.4 victims of modern slavery for 1,000 people in the world, and one in four victims of modern slavery are children. Out of them, 24.9 million people trapped in forced labor. With this alarming statistic, we can realize that my story is not alone. I am no longer in the union since a year ago, but I continue my advocacy as a survivor leader. I also founded an association in February 2002, a non-profit association where I can be contacted easily by the people who are abused or the migrant workers. They can contact me, contacted me easily in my social media account, such as FB or Messenger. I also continue my collaboration with CCUM, and today I am a board member, and I support also other victims on voluntary basis. We share common values on the importance of empowerment and the full participation of the victims. The CCUM since 1994 continue to combat trafficking of human beings for labor exploitation. It has supported more than 900 victims in more than 350 court hearings. The CCAM is actively working on victims' identification, psychosocial and legal support, but also on networking to better advocate for legal reforms and law applications to better protect victims' rights. Through the help of other survivors, we spread and share experiences in different community groups, such as the Filipino community in France. Every time they hear our battles, they send me a message and share their similar experience. Before COVID-19, my association organized friends' lessons and martial arts during weekends. Most of the time, these migrants came to check with us for free consultations, some as their working contracts and payrolls, if these are correct, or in case a non-respect of the conditions agreed by with their employers. So, dear fellow participants, you had understood the main roots why human trafficking, abuse, injustice starts. The poverty, lack of education, culture, because people in the village believe that going abroad will, will give them a better life and working abroad is the greener pasture what they never know, the real danger and risk waiting for them. Travel agencies and advantage of these women. The ignorance of the rights because of lack of information. Survivors know the exact ruin 
of the event because the experience in the first hand know how it feels to be the thin spot to be the victim. They know exactly their traffickers. The role of survivors plays a huge part in elaborating main design or picture of the phenomenon. They contribute their real own experiences for the improvement of policies, laws when it comes to immigration. Must put the employers accountable for their own crime. And for me, more fight, more to fight for. Further, we stack the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council. In my work with the CCM, other progress should be done. Cooperation and collaboration with NGOs, syndicates, and state actors to better identify and protect victims. Ratification of Convention 189, just to remind everyone that this coming June 16 is the 10th year anniversary of the ratification of the International Convention on Domestic Workers by ILO. <clears throat> but still, France didn't ratify the convention. Continuing my advocacy for this ratification and for effective national policies to protect domestic workers in main, is a main challenge for me. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Zita, you you can you can conclude your um, your intervention if you you feel so. Um, I just have a few words and. Um, uh, it's it's the end. Uh, oh, I know that it's a very long um, talk for me. Um, so the rest of my words is um, what I want. I repeat the primary needs of the victims uh, is the non-conditional support uh, for the human trafficking victims. Uh, um, and this non-conditional support is the administrative protection. Why administrative protection? It is because they don't have passport very often because it's confiscated by their employers. And uh, we need to help these victims to obtain their passport and to have their legal um, uh, document in the country to have, of course, a better job or legal work in France. Uh, shelter also because we need to put them in a decent uh, place to stay, uh, which in, in France we don't have that. Um, uh, we, we need to call the hotel uh, where we can put or uh, call a solidarity with the people who have an open heart to uh, receive the victims. Uh, um, health and health protection and the basic needs, of course. Um, and uh, first thing also is I want also to tell you that a victim that is threatened, frightened by the employer that oh, one day you will be killed or one day your family will be killed, uh, a victim cannot talk. So they need um, a, a very sensitive assistance. Um, um, and probably also a training of law enforcement actors like police, labor inspectors, uh, judges, and lawyers, um, and awareness uh, raising for public opinions, and effective national policy and the referral mechanism. I also want to include that um, maybe all the private employers, uh, house, household employers, uh, must also involve about the action because um, uh, we are working inside their apartments. We are alone there 
and um, only the employer and uh, the worker uh, inside the apartment. And uh, I think it's also a good thing uh, that the employers will also um, um, uh, participate to the action. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zita, for um, sharing with us your personal story and for the work you are doing to help other victims of human trafficking. What stood out to me that several times you said, I didn't know better. It was normal to me. Um, I didn't know better. So we really need to do a better job to informing uh, labor migrants about their rights and to building their resilience, which leads me to uh, you, Veiko. You implement uh, the national assistance system. You uh, implement the project focused on building employability skills for victims of human trafficking. Could you please tell us how successful victims of trafficking are in labor market? Well, thank you. Thank you, Vineta, for for your question and the possibility to participate in, in, this, uh, in this panel discussion. Um, I'll try to be brief since we are running out of time. Um, I think in, in, in general, we of course don't have lots of statistics on the matter. We don't know uh, precisely how, how the victims of human trafficking actually fare in the labor market. However, we do have some, uh, some uh, general understanding of the situation since we, we assist victims of human trafficking. Um, I think my first, first point in this uh, actually is, and I'm happy to hear what, what Annette already said about victims of human trafficking not being uh, a unite, united category of people. They are different, they have different backgrounds, they have different histories, uh, different experiences of the labor market and and also uh, the victimization itself might differ it, it might be different length and the severity of of uh, the victimization uh, is also different so that's why it's, it it varies a lot uh, depending on the victim and of course um, if you for instance in in a of course a general level compare a victim of uh, forced labor to a victim of, uh, for instance, uh, forced criminality. There, with, with victims of forced criminality, for instance, there are things, for instance, uh, criminal records that need to be taken into consideration when we are talking about is, is it and how, how possible it actually is to access the labor market. Uh, victims of um, uh, forced marriages don't necessarily have any understanding of the labor market since they don't really have any access to it. They have they are mostly home, so it, it varies a lot. Um, a second second point is here that victims of trafficking do and can access the labor market. It's possible. Um, we do have, m luckily. Uh, many, I would like to say many good stories about uh, victims finding jobs for themselves, a better job than the job that they, they uh, worked previously, where they are not treated badly, where they are paid fairly uh, and the employer is actually uh, doing what the employer is supposed to do uh, and protects the workers as well. We also have victims who have been uh, able to self-employ, uh, to find, found a company and, and thrive. Uh, be successful through that kind that's that kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurship however uh, there is there is another side to this coin um, victims of trafficking particularly when we're talking about uh, labor trafficking or or asylum seekers uh, in the Finnish context who have come to Finland have victimized perhaps uh, abroad or are trying to find uh, get an asylum in Finland but do not necessarily have the ability to get it uh, they might be in a place, and this is also what Zita, Zita told uh, or spoke about in her, in, her, uh, in her story, that you don't necessarily have any options other than uh, employing yourself to uh, to certain person who might already, that you already might know that is, is going to exploit you. Uh, and this is, this is also a thing that we as a society need to, need to discuss or it's, it's, I think the discussions should go wider than the Finnish society. What do we mean as a successful employment in general with victims of human trafficking? Do we mean that the victims of human trafficking get employed in a fair conditions or do we 
do we just want them to get employed in, in order then to be part of the society? A third point uh, here uh, is also about, you know, when we talk about uh, labor markets, we have to talk also about employment services since you, they are uh, ways of, of accessing the labor market. Uh, and here, I, I could say that the situation is the same than accessing the labor market. I think victims of trafficking in general, again in the Finnish context, do get uh, services uh, from employment offices. Uh, however, these services are not always targeted. The reasons behind it uh, can vary a lot. I think most, most commonly uh, the employment services uh, workers don't have enough understanding of, of what human trafficking is and therefore they cannot provide services uh, that would fit these, these victims who, are, who have been exploited whose traumatic experiences might influence a lot on how they actually can work in, in the markets. On the other hand, victims of human trafficking themselves cannot always uh, or are not always able to share their thoughts on what would you actually want to do? What, what is the thing that uh, would benefit me the most since you don't necessarily have the understanding of the situation, the legislation of employers' rights? And also, from from uh, there are there are things from cultural backgrounds that might hinder uh, hinder the way of of the victim speaking out from themselves, uh, and and not not just uh, letting other people decide for themselves out of out of shyness or or some other things. I think yeah, this is this is uh, my remarks on this. Thank you very much, um, Veiko. Your The work you are doing is such an excellent example that we need to go beyond this fix, uh, quick fix. We need to help uh, victims how they can live independent life. And it not only depends on them, but on the society, as you said. And um, if um, I may go, we have a little time left. If I could ask Annette very quickly a um, question. Um, many of uh, labor, mar uh, labor migrants who are exploited are not identified as victims of human trafficking. So where does it leave them? Are they entitled to, uh, should they be entitled to assistance? What state should do in this situation? I think that's, to be, try to be really brief about this crucial issue, I think that's kind of where the battle stands at the moment. And I think that it's absolutely necessary to secure rights for people who don't measure up in a way to this um, to this uh, very strict trafficking definition. So but in my view, I, I, ideally they would have the same rights really. I think that needs should, um, should uh, be more important here than which paragraph in the penal code we use. Thank you very, thank you very, thank you very much. That indeed was very uh, brief. And um, Veiko, if I can go back to you, uh, could you give some ex specific examples? So, what can we do? Um, what assistance systems could do to increase empl employability skills of uh, victims? Well, I think it's this is a really good question that we are also also pondering about in 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 our project. We are developing a model for victims of human trafficking uh, to increase their employability skills and and get better access to the labor markets. Uh, since the project is still still ongoing, uh, we don't have, of course, specific data yet. But but in 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 general. Uh, general ideas, of course, we have since since we have already re remade or or made built the model. Uh, I think first thing that we should definitely do is is focus on uh, giving uh, victims of human trafficking individual services regarding uh, employment uh, and labor labor market access. I think in general, uh, and this this applies to Finland. I think it applies to other Nordic countries as well. We have a good good general legislation but and and uh, means of of actually giving people different kind of services but but then again uh people are kind of lost in the mass in in the in the big masses of masses of people and and are not getting individual services uh and the more the services actually go online i think the harder it is for victims of human trafficking uh who need 
uh, services, a uh, lot of lot of face to face services to access them. So in order to to get the services to people, we we need them to be more individual, and we need to make sure that they get services. Uh, starting from how to build your resume, what is what are your rights in the labor market, uh, what are your rights as a human being, uh, how can you uh, work uh, in in job interview situations, and what kind of uh, ideas and expectations the employers have, but also not just to leave it for that, but also include and ex extend the help to the faces where victims of human trafficking do get employed. Since it's not always easy to, uh, act, you know, start start working uh, at all, and and uh, this this kind of help, as my second point, should also be extended to the private sector, and the private sector should be included in in uh, helping victims of human trafficking. Uh, of course, there are data protection things things here. We can't share anything, uh, and and it's not always uh, good to share things like like be person being a victim of human trafficking. To, uh, to people who are not, uh, who don't need that information. But however, we should we should find a way of uh, supporting also the the employers to understand that this person, not necessarily telling them that he, he or she is a victim of human trafficking, but has has, has previously uh, experience of exploitation or or bad experiences that might influence uh, his or her ability to actually. Work. There might be traumatic, uh, traumatic cases that impact uh, at some some period of time that make make the person's ability to work uh, not that good. We have good models, examples of this, for instance, in the UK with with the company Co-op, and also training, more training, particularly to uh, the labour services, uh, so that we better understand the situation, can identify victims better, but also to assist them in, in the labor market. Thank you, Veiko. Thank you very much. Thank you to all panelists. This is extremely important um, subject, uh, but unfortunately we need to close this panel for today. Thank you. Thank you again for your um, work and for your um, wonderful contributions today. And now I would like to pass the screen to the State Secretary of the Ministry of Interior of Latvia, to Mr. Dimitri Trofimos. Please, Dimitri, the floor and the screen is yours for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear participants, uh, on, behalf, on behalf of the Ministry of Interior of Latvia, it's my big honor uh, to say uh, closing remarks. Let me begin by thanking all the participants, excellent speakers, moderators, and of course my colleagues from the Ministry of the Interior of Lithuania and the CBSS for organizing this event in fantastic quality and with excellent content. But most of all, I would like to express my gratitude to all survivors who share their stories, who defend the rights of victims and work actively to save other people from failing into the trap of human trafficking. Those people are the cornerstone of the response against trafficking in the human beings for labor exploitation. Today, we have a great opportunity to look at the trafficking in human beings for labor exploitation in a more wider perspective. I think we all can agree that in the last decade, we have learned about uh, that phenomena uh, very much and this conference provided an opportunity to reflect on our achievements or challenges we faced. But most importantly, we can now learn from the past. 
Let's remember what conclusions we made today during the conference. In panel one, we looked at the concept of preventing and combating the human trafficking for labor exploitation. It's rather evident that we need to promote full strategies, such as including survivors of labor exploitation in our work. We also need to take the courage to evaluate previous strategies, which perhaps have to be so effective or even have been counterproductive. Therefore, I encourage the ambition of the CBSS and today's conference to propose the questions needed in order to learn from each other and improve our future work. Panel two was dedicated to the recruitment of migrant workers and labor law. An important question was raised here, do we risk facilitating forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation without knowing it? Finally, speakers in panel three highlighted the main steps needed to increase individual and community resilience to forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation. We need to offer proper services to all victims that will help victims to recover from the trauma of trafficking and to start a new independent life together, together with, all if, with all of in one society. Of course, it's our duty and obligation to provide adequate and comprehensive assistance beyond emergency assistance to people who experience exploitation. At the end of the day, we can conclude that participants of the conference present many good practice that were asked today at the very beginning of the conference. I hope that we all leave the conference with a better understanding and awareness of that phenomena. Most important, we had many recommendations on how and what can be done to improve our responses to labor exploitation and trafficking. In this regard, I must refer to the joint statement of commitment to work against the human trafficking for labor exploitation in the Baltic Sea region that encloses a number of steps that needed to be taken. In conclusion, let me once again express my appreciation to the work over the past years, and we look forward to continuing to work together on this important issue also in 2000 and 2021 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, State Secretary, for the work Ministry of Interior does uh, to prevent and combat trafficking for labor exploitation. And thank you to you personally for your uh, commitment and support. Um, we would like to thank all the panelists and all of you, our dear participants, who engaged, who stayed with us during this day. Thank you. This conference might come to an end, but our work against trafficking for labor exploitation will not. Coming back to the opening panel, our ambitions always need to be reflected in our concrete actions against this form of organized crime. With that said, our conference is officially closed. Thank you everybody for today. Lea Spaldias, Achula Bay.